bunch of complexes. Otherwise, if you gave me the three dollars, it wasn't the cost of complexes, you would have been checked. But this is the college that we're going to hear about thorium reactors uh, tonight. Uh, our speaker. So without any further ado, we will hear from our speaker, John Cook. Just leave the lights on, Charlie. We're good. Yeah, it looks okay. All right. Is that loud enough back there? What'd you say? Is that loud? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. I'm what my uncle used to call a loud talker, so I might not even need the amplification all that much. But uh, my name is John Kutch. I am the executive director of the Thorium Energy Alliance. We started the Thorium Energy Alliance about five years ago. Do you want to and, uh, you might see the cakes? It was uh, a result of one of my clients. I run an engineering company. And we help companies develop new products, processes, things like that. And uh, one of the clients said, hey, you know, we're looking for a replacement for some of the uh, materials we use in our process. <clears throat> and the guy kept giving us a list of materials to look at, and it basically was just running through the periodic table. So we get to thorium, you know, we're working our way, 80, 89, 90. we get to thorium, and uh, I was really fascinated by the history of thorium and, uh, and the potential of thorium and the uh, energy density and all the other uh, uh, things that go along with, with uh, the use of this as an energy source. So we moved on from that project, we kept going down the periodic table, <clears throat> but we, uh, I never lost interest in the idea that, hey, this is a this is uh, something that could really make a huge difference in, the, in, in our future. Cake, and so we started the Thorium Energy Alliance, and we've pudding, spent the last five years trying to uh, cake redirect uh, our nation's efforts from trying to develop, you know, new and different forms of solid fuel reactors that are what every reactor built to this day is and divert them to a thing that uh, you'll soon learn about as a uh, uh, molten salt fueled reactor. And uh, that is a that particular type of reactor is highly optimized to use uh, uh, thorium as its fuel source. So let me uh, go down and see what's there. So what's the mission of Thorium Energy Alliance? Or well, a 501c3 organization, nonprofit. Uh, we. Uh, spend a tremendous amount of our own time and energy and money trying to educate the public. That's what I'm here for. Trying to uh, get uh, our representatives in Congress and different state houses to understand uh, what their options are. And this might get a little deep in the weeds for you, but you know some of this does get technical. The uh, you know we uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has very exhaustive regulations on solid fuel reactors, but they have no regulations at all on liquid fuel reactors, even though the technology has been around for about 60 years. So we try to do our best to get them to start that process. And uh, the rest is pretty straightforward. Uh, one thing that I want to point out here is uh, restart rare earth production, okay? And so. One major difference right out of the gate is most every other energy source, you have to do a tremendous amount of knock on mining or processing of materials. You know, with solar, you've got a lot of rare earths, right? And the way you make a solar cell is not that much different than making just a giant electronic circuit, right? So you're going to be burning and etching and using some fairly poisonous materials. But mostly, you're using a lot of resources to create that theoretically clean per energy source. And then, if you like coal, who knows? Probably not many of you like coal all that much. But you got to mine that out of the ground. Uranium, 
uranium, you have to specifically go after uranium and you mine it in a very arduous, expensive process and then after that you have to enrich it. <clears throat> so one of the best things you can find out about thorium is that you get thorium when you get rare earths. So do you love solar? Great! You need rare earths to do solar. And if you're going to mine rare earths anywhere on this planet, you're going to wind up with a lot of byproduct called thorium, right? Do you like windmills? I bet you do. Well, those windmills use about 300 pounds of neodymium in their magnets. Neodymium is a rare earth, and every 300 pounds of neodymium would create about 300 pounds of thorium, right? So you better start thinking, hey, no energy source is cost-free, but thorium does come about naturally as part of the rare earth refining process. So there's no such thing as a thorium mine. There's no such thing as highly enriched thorium. Thorium is usable right out of the ground from the refining process to get the rare earths to make the things we all love. <coughs> like these fluorescent lights? I bet no, you do. No, we well, they have rare earths in them. <laughs> Your cell phone has rare earths in them. This little recorder, rare earths. We can't live a modern life without rare earths. And so if we're going to depend on rare earths, which today, 99% of all the commercial rare earths come from China, okay? And that's how they're able to take our businesses, like Magnaflux and MagnaQuench and all the other companies, Siemens, General Electric, they're basically blackmailed into moving to China because that's the only way they can get a guaranteed supply of rare earths. So do you like your solar cells? Well, if you keep up on it, you'll know that most solar cells are being made in China now at below cost. They're being dumped in our markets. If you like windmills? They're being made in China now. Because where can you make the motors and the generators for the windmills? Nowhere else but China anymore. Because the only place you can get a guaranteed source of rare earths is China. So, in order to start a thorium energy future, we do have to restart rare earth processing in the United States. You want to have good manufacturing jobs? Making the things of the future that we all like so much, like rare earth magnet starter motors on every single car, like radios, like televisions, then we got to start working on rare earths in cooperation with thorium research. And so why am I doing this? Why do I take all my time to do this, spend uh, exceedingly crazy amounts of money and, and, and energy doing this? Well, it's got to be done. You know, we can't be left behind in energy. All of us here are sitting in a room illuminated by electricity. We all lead an incredibly energy-intensive life, right? We use more power per person than anywhere else in the world. We use 30% more electricity and other energy sources than even Europeans. And Europeans use about 60% more than anyone else in the world. Every single American uses about 10 times more electricity than the Chinese or the Indians. So if you like this life, we have to have base load always on energy. All right, so let's go get some more whys. Let me see if I can get rid of this thing in the corner here. All right. Rare earths are the elements near the end of the periodic table and they exhibit extraordinary properties. For instance, a neodymium magnet, you just have a plain iron magnet like you had sticking on your refrigerator. Let's say that magnet could hold about 10 pounds. A neodymium magnet would be able to hold 1,000 pounds just by adding a little small, it's very catalytic in nature. Just like, a, just like adding a catalyst to your catalytic converter in the form of, uh, uh, oh, uh, darn it, uh, uh, platinum. You know, the platinum is able to process millions of cubic feet of exhaust and keeps recycling itself in a sense. Neodymium, uh, lucitinium, dysprosium, Samarium, these are all things that allow us to live the lives we lead. The, every petroleum cracking facility that makes your gasoline and diesel and plastics uses giant amounts of samarium cracking surfaces to crack the <coughs> petroleum. And it saves millions and millions of pounds of, of uh, CO2 because it's much, much more efficient than it used to be 20, 30 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> 
Lucitinium is used in CAT scans and charge couple devices. So these things are all around us. Uh, the, the red diodes in a, uh, in a cell phone or an LED, those are, uh, those are based on rare earths. That was what they were originally used for when we started first mining and using rare earths in the 1930s. It was used for like picture tubes and vacuum tubes because they knew that it made them much, much more efficient. So it's a, it's a very interesting group of, of, of uh, elements that have, in, we can talk about it a little more later during the question time, but what's fascinating about them is that they, they're, they're, for a group of 17 atoms, they're almost identical. It's a weird stretch of the uh, periodic table where these atoms almost, it's, it's very hard to separate them because they're so identical, but they all have incredibly different and unbelievable, almost like magical properties, <laughs> you know, and it's what allows us to miniaturize things and make tiny little things and super ultra efficient things. Let's talk about this guy here, you know. We're about to, we're at seven plus billion people. We're uh, spitting distance from nine billion people. Nine billion people who want to live the way we do. China wants to live like us. India wants to live like us. The whole rest of the world. And we all know that even we can't live like we do, right? So we're using up resources faster than the Earth can uh, provide them. And having nine billion people trying to do that, not probably a very good thing, certainly in the energy paradigm that we have today. And com conflicts of the future, what are they? You know, we have water, food, energy, materials. All these people, you know, you got people who literally make their living inside garbage dumps. You got infrastructure that's deteriorating. You can just look around at you and see it. You see food riots. We're using Africa as a toxic waste dumping ground. You know, we can't continue doing this. So, one of the other things that you're probably interested in is proliferation, right? And so the current nuclear paradigm of solid fuels, that leads to uh, things like proliferation. Whereas thorium, by itself, as a material, can't be used in a nuclear weapon, right? So that's another interesting thing about thorium. It's four times more abundant than uranium. There's more thorium in the Earth's crust than lead. Thorium cannot be used in a nuclear weapon. Thorium is fissile, not fertile. When you get uranium, and you put enough uranium in one spot, it'll start to uh, it'll start to react and go up. Whereas you can have millions of pounds of thorium in one place, and it won't go up because it's fissile. It means it's pregnant. It's got lots of protons, neutrons. It's like that scene in Monty Python's Flying Circus where the guy's like, oh, I couldn't eat another bite. Well, that's that guy. He's sitting there, you know, Thorium's like, oh my god, I got a lot of neutrons sitting here. I'm, I'm very pregnant with neutrons and protons, but he's just, he's very stable. Half-life for a Thorium atom, 14 and a half billion years. So, it's an incredibly stable element. It's not water soluble. So that means uranium, which is incredibly water soluble, gets in, and because uranium can be used by the human body, or at least mistaken by the human body and other organisms, can be absorbed, whereas thorium's biologically inert. I could eat thorium, it would go through me, it wouldn't be super pleasant, but at the end it would come out and I wouldn't die from it. It's an alpha emitter, it's not a gamma emitter, it's not a beta emitter. If you want, you can ask me about that a little later, but basically, if I held a ball of thorium in my hand, my skin is enough of a barrier to protect me from the alpha emissions. If I took a piece of uh, thorium this big, held it in front of a Geiger counter, it, it'd be like... <sighs> paper can block the alpha emissions of thorium. So thorium's a... <laughs> Pretty good stuff, you know. Let's talk about what we're starting to spend our resources on now. You know, we're losing intellectual property and physical resources and political influence to China. Now, if, <clears throat> nothing more, you know, I don't expect to change a lot of minds. Uh, 
but I hope to influence a lot of minds, and I hope you understand that China is a big threat to us, okay? They're not our partners. They're not, you know, advocates for us. They are doing what they have to do to help their people get out of the abject situation that they're in. Whereas our government is allowing us to lose intellectual property, we're allowing physical, real capital resources to be transferred very quickly, and we're losing political influence. Now, you may not like it, but China is building reactors and giving them out to countries around the world the way we used to practice a thing called Atoms for Peace. China's practicing Atoms for Peace. <laughs> so, we're in a tough spot. We've got a really bad energy dependent situation. Uh, fracking and natural gas have limited the amount of coal and some of the imports that we have to have. But fracking has its own issues, right? You really want to drink that water when it's, uh, you know, can catch on fire? You want to see what the consequences are after 100 years of fracking? So, we're not going to lose our dependence on liquid petroleum products from other countries. Canada, <laughs> Norway, Malaysia, Indonesia, let alone countries in the Middle East that are not our best friends. So we're spending $750 billion a year on liquid fuels in other countries. You really want to see how long the United States can keep putting $750 billion a year into other economies and not into our own? It can't last forever. And as one famous economist said, things that can't last forever don't. <laughs> so, so 10 million manufacturing jobs gone since 2001. Remember, this is a little self-serving. I'm an engineer. I run an engineering consultancy, and I'm losing clients. My clients are leaving this country. I want to live in a country that gives opportunity to people, still has a place for craftsmen and machinists, and not just bankers and people who push paper around, but people who actually make things and produce things, make our lives better. And so, you know, I don't want to beat on this too much, but the reason that we've been pursuing solar and wind as an objective of the Department of Energy, and we can talk about the Department of Energy and what their true objectives are, uh, this crowd, I probably don't need to tell you that the true objective of the Department of Energy is to ensure that the uh, nuclear weapons stockpile remains viable. You know, 60% of the DOE budget goes towards keeping nuclear weapons viable, and very, very, very little of it goes towards trying to stand things like this up. But what they do spend, it isn't for energy. They know that the energy created by windmills and solar cells is diffuse, not easily stored, things you have to store it in, use vast amounts of energy to create that material to store the energy in. Not as green as it seems to be. Why do we do it? It creates a lot of jobs. I don't know if you guys spend a lot of time in the country, but I got a little farm in Iowa, and it's solar powered as a matter of fact. But I pass a lot of wind farms, and the wind farms out by Lena, and out by Freeport, use a lot of workers and a lot of physical resources. And these solar cells and solar concentrators that they're starting to stand up in the deserts out in California, they're going to cover a mile, square mile of desert out in California with these solar concentrators that need to be cleaned every day with water in the desert, okay? There's no free lunch, people. These things might come with a little smiley face written on them. The smiley face is painted with poison ink, okay? So start to get real about what your energy choices are and the lifestyle you live. Okay, let's uh, look at it a little bit here. Wind turbine, 115,000 pounds for the nacelle, 48,000 pounds for the rotor assembly, 58,000 pounds of reinforcing steel, 250 cubic yards of concrete. Power and fiber optics going to everyone, and then you put it somewhere where it's not by a city, so your transmission loss is up to 40%. Okay? Starts to look like a pretty bad deal, right? When this thing can only put out 2 megawatts of power at over $4 million a megawatt, 
If you want base load energy, even if that thing spun 24 hours a day, what's a thousand megawatts that cost? About eight billion dollars. Everyone talks about, man, nuclear sure does cost a lot. I'm sure no defender of solid fuel nuclear. Very distinct. I do not like solid fuel nuclear. I'm a molten salt liquid fuel guy. But even these things are a ripoff compared to nuclear power, which is always on, all the time, and not carbon emitting. How about these things? You probably can't read it from there, but that's a riot in China over all the toxic waste being poured into the rivers in China from solar cell production. So your precious solar cells are killing Chinese. So you're, you're offloading your toxic debt to the earth onto the backs of poverty-stricken Chinese. And then, you know, just to get back in your corner a little bit, look at this pathetic. You know, we're, we're sitting there crying bloody tears over Solyndra, huh? These people are like, oh, God, we lost all this money. Poor, poor America. How can we afford this money we spent on Solyndra? Well, look what these other countries are spending developing nuclear or, uh, solar power just to export the panels to the United can States. You, uh, can you tell us the numbers? We can't see that. Uh, well, this is about uh, $500 million, and this is... Uh, is that on your website? Yeah, it's on the website. Okay. So, you know, going over some of the bullet points about thorium real quick, I'll just blow through this pretty quick. Thorium is four times more abundant than uranium. Hundreds of times more energy per pound than uranium based on uh, solid fuel systems. This little ball, if that were thorium, that's all the thorium you would use in your entire life living an American lifestyle. That's airplane trips, that's heating your house, that's turning the lights on, that's driving your car. Thorium is six and a half million times more energy dense than coal. It's all the thorium you would use in your entire life. And it comes for free when we redevelop the rare earth industry in this country in order to attract manufacturing jobs back to this country to make the products of the future that we want in order to live the life that we want to live. Here's some good stuff. So the molten salt reactor that I'm about to show you, this isn't a paper reactor, this isn't a theory, this thing ran for 22,000 hours back in the 1960s. So this is a proven system, proven to be safe, reliable, efficient. Getting uranium, or getting a thorium, getting a pound of thorium is 5,000 times cleaner than getting a pound of enriched uranium. That's a pretty good number. As I keep saying, you get it free in the process of refining rare earths. A molten salt reactor eats actinides. All that stuff you see in parking lots of nuclear reactor facilities, all the dry cast storage, it's not nuclear waste. That's spent nuclear fuel. Big difference. 95 to 99% of the energy in those fuel rods sitting in the parking lot is still there. When we put a fuel bundle into a nuclear reactor, we only use half to one. The French use up to about 5%. 95 to 99% of the fuel is left in the fuel rods because the zircaloy alloy containment can't handle being uh, exposed to the water and the, the neutrons and all the other things for too long. So as a safety measure, we replace millions and millions of pounds of these exceedingly expensive and complex fuel rod assemblies every 18 months. And so that parking lot of every nuclear facility in the world is filled. 99%, 95% of the energy that we took out of the ground is still sitting there. And it'll be there for generations. Well, this molten salt reactor that I talk about, a little illustration down there, can eat that. They're actinide burners. You can take the plutonium and you can take the cesium and you can take the leftover uranium, the uranium 233, 235, 238, and you can feed it, liquefy it, and put it into a thorium reactor and get vast amounts of energy out of it. While at the same time you're cleaning up your spent fuel. It's not waste because you know what you get out the back end of a molten salt reactor? 
Well, you get one one thousandth the waste. A hundred megawatt molten salt reactor running for ten years would create about one pound of actinide product. One pound. And it's actinide product because in that one pound we can get medical isotopes, industrial isotopes. You get cancer someday, you're going to be glad that there was nuclear isotopes available. Right now we get them from a 50-year-old maple reactor in Canada and a 40-year-old reactor in South Africa and precious few other places. These molten salt reactors could make good, high-quality materials used for space travel, used for cancer treatment, used for analyzing materials in industrial settings. So this is pretty good stuff, huh? Here's another thing about a molten salt reactor. No containment building. Remember, this whole process is cooled by a salt, and we'll get into it a little more. But these molten salt reactors use no water. They don't have cooling towers. Therefore, they don't have pressure vessels around them. A 10 megawatt molten salt reactor would be about the size of this table. dressing. So there it is. That's the actual reactor. This was a 6 megawatt power, 10 megawatt heat, molten salt reactor built by a man named Alvin Weinberg in the 1960s at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. This is a man, so you can see. This is the hot cell. That's where the power takes place and the loop is fairly visible. This is a pump. Comes down here, goes to the pump, goes through the heat exchanger, goes back in. That's it. There are four, five quintuple redundant power strokes. There aren't recirculating systems. There aren't special emergency nuclear rated shutoff valves. The salt that flows through the system does not become liquid until it reaches 400 degrees Celsius. Okay? So that's what makes this system walk away safe. If this pump ever stops pumping, the salt going through the system will get hot. And this gives you another idea of how big that reactor core is. You know, so it's not like one of these huge buildings. So this gives you an idea of the reactor core. That's what the salt looks like. It's water clear and water thin when it's molten. So when that, but the second you take the heat off of it, the second the salt gets below 400 degrees, it solidifies. So you don't run these things under a pressure vessel. There's no water to flash off into hydrogen and oxygen and explode. There's no steam involved in this, in this loop. There's, and there's a plug that you can see here that if it gets too hot, the plug melts. The plug is literally just a section of pipe that has a fan blowing on it and the salt is kept solid there. And so if something like Fukushima happened, where they lost power, the fans would stop blowing, the reactor would get kind of a little bit hotter than it operates at, it would melt the salt plug, and all the, all the salt, all the fueled salt would flow out and go into a drainage tank. So this is your reactor vessel. There's a salt plug right here. Something horrible happens, who knows? It drains out into these tanks that are divided so that no reaction can take place. Within a couple days it solidifies into a solid piece that can be reused again, remelted once you've solved whatever problem made you have that failure, whether a terrorist flew a plane into it or whether an earthquake or whatever. Even if the vessel itself somehow cracked open, the dish shape of the floor would drain the fuel down into the containment facility. And you can see, that's all there is to it. We don't have recuperators and regenerators and, and recovery systems and, and backup water towers. That's all, the, that's all the system is. Goes through the heat exchanger, cools off a little bit, goes through the pump, goes into there. Round and round, simple circle. And the miracle of it, the reason that is, is that you know just a little bit about nuclear power. Sort of like what I was saying before, if you get, if you get 
if you have a little bit of uranium here, not that big a deal. If you start accumulating uranium or something like that, it'll react by itself, right? Because you need a certain cross-section of this nuclear material for it to react. So that's exactly what they're taking advantage of here. When the fuel is going through the pipe, the cross-section of the pipe is relatively small, you know, something like that. And then all of a sudden it goes into the reaction chamber, the cross-section gets to about three meters wide, cross-section is big enough, reaction takes place, and it's a heck of a reaction. These things run at 700 to 800 degrees Celsius. So why is that important? Well, why are we making electricity? We're making electricity to do processes that we deem necessary. We make fertilizer with electricity. We purify water with electricity. We do all sorts of stuff with electricity. We smelt aluminum. We smelt stainless steel. What if you didn't need to make electricity first? Remember, a light water reactor or a coal reactor, you know, we'll just call it a coal reactor or a coal boiler or whatever you want, they can only get up to about three, 400 degrees Celsius tops. That's why they need the pressure vessel, because the pressure is what keep, gets you the energy. You know, if you boil water at atmosphere, it boils at what? 212 degrees, right? 100 degrees Celsius. If you want it to boil at 400, you got to hold it in at 3,000 psi, creating a really big, you know, thing waiting to go, go kaboom. Whereas if this salt, under no pressure, I could literally take the top off of this. I could take the top off of this thing if I was impervious to neutrons, that is. But if I could take the top off the thing, it would look like a jacuzzi. You know, the salt would just be flowing around in there. No pressure. It's under no pressure. It's even argued that it's actually under a vacuum while it's running. But well, the, the thorium is the fuel in the salt. So it's, it's literally like if you could melt your table salt. It's just a it's just a vehicle that carries the fuel. So it's just a it's just something that carries the fuel and provides the coolant. It's combined. You you with the salt, the salt is both the coolant and the fuel. So, so you got 800 degrees, let's say. Why make electricity in the first place? The real reason you would make a molten salt reactor in this country today isn't for electricity. We got natural gas for that now. You know, we make natural gas electricity cheaper than we could ever make nuclear electricity or even liquid fuel, uh, liquid chemical, you know, petroleum. Certainly cheaper than coal even now. How crazy is that? You can make natural gas. So why would you build this? What's the reason for building this in the United States? Process heat. At 800 degrees Celsius, we can, we can reform carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and make fertilizers, diesel fuel. We can purify water. We could even take the remnants of the coal industry and process coal into jet fuel and extract out of the coal itself, uranium and thorium. Did you know there's more power in the uranium and thorium locked in coal than the coal itself? We could justify mining coal just to get the uranium and the thorium out of it and then put the coal back in the ground. <laughs> it's just from an energy budget. Isn't that amazing? That blew my mind when somebody explained that. Plus, you know, if you're not burning coal and sending ash and mercury and soot and sulfur up the flume, those things are pretty valuable. Sulfur is used by lots of industries. Mercury used by the battery industries. Maybe these windmills, you know, might need some batteries. You know, the soot is a valuable thing even. If you can contain it, you can use it in cement and other construction industries. So maybe, maybe you turn coal, you know, there's a thought experiment for you, wrap your head around it. Coal goes from being the most filthy, horrible energy source to a clean energy source. Well, if that blow your brains apart. So, but it gives you an idea, why waste 40% of the heat energy yeah. making electricity to go and do something else with it? Just take this, now this is what's called a heat loop, take that heat loop and do work with just the heat itself. You're already at 800 degrees, start looking at industrial processes that require 800 degrees of heat, Celsius, and you'll notice, man, there's a lot of stuff we can do, and just doing that, think about we'd have to generate half the amount of electricity. Because if we're using electricity to, to process petroleum today, which we are, 
and instead we take it and we just use a molten salt reactor to process petroleum, that's 50% less CO2 emission just from the production of gasoline and diesel. There's a lot of knock-on effects to doing this. And of course you can make electricity, but you can make it more efficient than any electricity has ever been made before. Going back in the 60s, they knew, you know, they did their little balance of power, and they knew, they, they knew that, hey, we could make a system, you know, it was called a Brayton cycle. You want to look that up, Brayton cycle? B-R-A-Y-T-O-N. And so a Brayton cycle turbine can be up to 66% efficient. A normal wet steam turbine today might be 40% efficient. Maybe you might get up to 50% efficient. You know, just call it 50%. That extra 16% efficiency from a Brayton cycle would create a huge surplus of energy. And it only works, though, if you have a heat source that's up around those temperatures. So back in the 60s when they invented the molten salt reactor and they invented the Brayton cycle react, uh, turbine system, they were made for each other. We just never developed them. We've known about this technology for 50 years. It's maddening. Uh, we can't use Brayton really with a, with a nuclear reactor solid fuel today. We can't really use uh, a Brayton system with a coal fire uh, system because it's too, uh, it's too, uh, it doesn't have enough energy density. It's not hot enough. But with this, we could start generating electricity, vast amounts of electricity, with much, much smaller plants. And because these plants are smaller and more concentrated, we can put them closer to where they're needed. You all probably like looking at the internet, probably like looking at YouTube videos. You know, watching one two-minute YouTube video, you could drive your average car 100 feet down the road. A tremendous amount of energy locked up in watching YouTube videos and searching on the internet. That's why all these transmission centers, all these head ends, are placed next to what? Hydroelectric dams, uh, power generation facilities. Because they, you know, one single uh, YouTube facility built by Google uses 70 megawatts of power. A lot of power just to watch cat videos. So this would be the, this would be the sort of thing that you would put co-located in an industrial park. Because remember, can't make a bond with it. No terrorist is going to try and break in and take something from it. It's walk away safe. It's super simple, very elegant. It very compact. Remember, it's about 100 times more energy dense than any fuel source that we have today. So there's a lot going on with this. Let's back up a little bit here. I'll just give you like a two second history. That guy over there is Alvin Weinberg. He invented both the light water reactor and the molten salt reactor, or he had a big hand in it. And back in the 1954, they, uh, you know, he said, Hey, you know, if we're going to have a civilian nuclear program, it should really be thorium-based. Even in solid fuel, thorium works better than uranium or plutonium. And, and if we could, we should make the civilian nuclear program a, a liquid fuel program. You know, we might, you know, in the Cold War, yeah, we want the solid fuel stuff because we really like plutonium because we like making bombs, things like that. We know a lot about it. They've already had 10 good years of working with that sort of reactor. But he really, really pushed. He said, hey, civilian, you don't want to do that in the civilian world. You want to, you want to use thorium because it's safe. And you want to use molten salt reactors because they're safer. And because of the 1954 Atomic Energy Act, it listed thorium, uranium, and plutonium as the three nuclear fuels, which was really good back in 1954 because that's what provided the money to build things like, this is uh, the unfortunately named fireball reactor. <laughs> but that was, uh, that was uh, an incredibly dense. That thing put out 70 megawatts of power for seven hours. And it was originally intended before they had ICBMs, you know, the way they justified it. They all knew it was ridiculous, but what the heck, it was research money. But the idea was they were going to build a flying submarine, essentially, a plane that could fly for three, four months at a time. You'd have a couple of these fireballs in there, and the jet engines would be thermally, exothermally powered by the vast amounts of energy in that fireball. You know, so you'd have about 170 megawatts of power. It'd literally be like a flying submarine. You could stay on station for three, four months. Yeah, it was kind of a oddly cool idea, but it's, you know, it was really, they just used it as their their justification for building one of these things. 
So they didn't just build one, they built the aqueous reactor, which was a uranium water reactor. They built the ARE, the aircraft reactor experiment, and they built the MSRE, the molten salt reactor experiment. So these things, you know, there was a time when we did a lot of work in these. So we're trying to revive that, and uh, one of the things is that we have to say, so who's working on this right now? Well, not really the United States, unfortunately, maybe a little bit, you know, here and there, but the real people working on this are India, Japan, Norway, Russia, Brazil, Canada. A lot of opportunity for Canada to get in this, because remember, when you got lots and lots of process heat, and you're currently throwing away billions and billions of cubic feet of natural gas, trying to squeeze tar out of the ground in your tar sands. They have every reason in the world to stop putting pollution in the air and stop burning natural gas that they could sell to the Americans. So they've got every they've got every reason to spend the money that it would take to develop this heat source to much more cleanly extract and process the tar sands. You know, well that's their reason. You know, but who's really developing this right now? Mostly China. China's committed over a billion dollars and 450 researchers. They've already got a working heat loop with neutronic stand-ins, which means they're only a few years away from introducing a pre-commercialized reactor and doing some tests on it. And you might say, eh, so what, we'll just buy these reactors from China. Well, they're not going to sell them to us. One, they won't sell them to us, period, but if they do let us use them, they'll lease them to us. So what are we going to do? Exchange Saudi Arabia for China to have our heat source? Probably not the best deal in the world. So again, just to run through it real quick, this is our heat loop. It's called a hot cell. It would be buried 80, 90 feet below ground. We have a little management building. This was designed for the University of Illinois, actually. So this would be a little school building, actually. We'd have two other facilities, the plumbing after the heat exchanger would send hot salt out to these two facilities. One facility would be for developing the Brayton cycle and other advanced electrical generators. The other one would be a heat loop for studying different processes like creating fertilizer and capturing CO2 right out of the atmosphere and turning it into jet fuel, things like that. And of course this much, much more subterranean, probably 100 feet under the ground, 120 would be the uh, liquid salt containment, whether whether you drain the tank for maintenance or you drain it in an emergency, you'd have this lower chamber for capturing the salt. And what happens if the salt spills all over the ground? Turns back into a solid. You know, it doesn't turn into a gas. Doesn't turn into a cloud. Doesn't drift over the cities and towns. Goes turns into the stuff. When it's solid, it looks a lot like table salt. You could literally sweep it up pour it back in the system and melt it down again. I always tell people it's like a candle, right? You've got a candle on your table, you've got a hundred candles on your table, doesn't matter, you know, they're not going to light themselves. What you would do is, if you lit the candle, you get heat and light and energy out of the candle, the wax turns water clear, well, the white candle, you know, the wax turns water clear, you can see right through it. If your cat jumps on the table and knocks it over, the wax doesn't explode into a giant cloud and blow up your house. It spills over your table. And if you're particularly frugal, you can scrape that wax back up, put it in the candle, stand the candle back up again, swat the cat, relight the candle. You know? So you're pretty good. So that's a good analogy for how this thing works. And, and I'll just touch on it one more time. Remember, it's an actinite burner. So, Thorium can't start the process by itself, right? It's fizzle. Doesn't matter how much thorium you get in one place, it's not going to go off. The Chinese make 99% of the rare earths. They've literally got silos and piles and mountains of thorium sitting around their facilities. <laughs> fissile means that it's pregnant, but it can't react by itself. Fertile, or uh, it's fertile. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mix that up. Yeah. It's fertile, meaning it's it's pregnant with neutrons. It can it could go off if you were able to give it one more neutron, one more neutron. And so where it gets those neutrons, it gets them from the stuff that you might call waste. We 
call it spent fuel. You can take some of the spent fuel that's sitting in parking lots. It's giving off neutrons all the time. Why don't we use it? So we can use the, the neutron source of that stuff sitting in parking lots to fuel this, to start the fuel process of this reactor to get a sustaining reaction. And at the same time, we eat up the, the stuff that we call nuclear waste, I would call spent fuel. Alright, so this thing didn't come out, but it's just a, it's just a further cutaway view of uh, that facility. So, uh, some of the other, you know, who, who needs these things, we already talked about it, uh, about medical isotopes and industrial isotopes. And one thing I did point out is that, as of today, We've lost 4,000 soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan, and I've got two friends, one in Iraq and one in Afghanistan right now. We've lost 4,000 soldiers doing what? Transporting bottles of water and jerry cans of diesel and gasoline to forward operating bases. 4,000 men and women had to lose their lives to deliver bottled water and cans of gas to run generators to our soldiers in the front lines. Now, the wars are ridiculous, they should never have been fought, but the fact is, I've got family and friends there, and until they get out, they're going to be in an incredible danger. Look at Pakistan, incredibly unstable country that holds our gas and our food hostage at the border. It's just an untenable situation. So, the military does want to support this, let's be honest with you, because they want forward operating reactors. Remember, walk away safe, can't make a bomb out of them, relatively cheap, incredibly robust. You can imagine, if you've got a large forward operating base, you take a 10 megawatt reactor, you make your own diesel fuel right from the atmosphere, you purify water, you can recharge all the electric Humvees and all the other batteries, and you can save 4,000 soldiers' lives. So it would be a big deal. Same thing with the Navy. You may have heard of the Green Navy that just uh, left uh, this week. Um, the Green Navy's looking at this also. Same thing with the Turbine Hall. Who would support this work? Well, companies like Boeing, Rolls-Royce, Pratt & Whitney, so good old American companies, Siemens, Toshiba, Hitachi, they would also uh, so that they would support this. And so how would you make these? So remember, you could fit you could fit a 10 to 70 megawatt hot cell electric generation facility and heat loop in a room the size we're sitting in right now. It's air-cooled, no giant cooling towers, nothing like that. 70 megawatts electricity, that is incredibly dense. How many windmills would it take to generate 70 megawatts electricity? And how many thousands and millions of pounds of resources would a windmill farm creating 70 constant megawatts always on electricity take? But when you get down to a size this big, this room's what? Maybe four or five good sized containers, shipping containers, big? We could build these reactors, these safe, walk away safe, highly efficient reactors the way we build these planes. Now these planes are a hell of a lot more complex than people actually sit in them. Nobody's ever going to sit inside the hot cell of a molten salt reactor. And a molten salt reactor sure has a heck of a lot less wiring and plumbing. And yet we fly in these all the time and we make one or two a day. We could set up a factory where we made 100 megawatt reactor and one 200 megawatt reactor and one 70 megawatt reactor every week. And in 30 years we could replace all the generation capacity provided today by coal and natural gas and other liquid fuels. We have 10,000 years of thorium in the Earth's crust using energy at 10 times the rate we use it today. We don't have 10,000 years worth of energy of any other source. We don't even have 10,000 years worth of energy of wind or solar because in order to use 10 times more energy supplied by wind and solar and water geothermal hydroelectric wave action 
biomass, whatever you want to call it. It's too diffuse. It's too irregular. It's not consistent. You can't run a society on it. And you certainly can't run on a society or a planet using 10 times the amount of energy that we use today. And remember, a lot of those things I just mentioned, biomass, hydroelectric killing fish. we got to make decisions. We live this life. How do we live it and walk the most gently on this earth as possible? Well, you do that by utilizing thorium to create the future of energy. Okay? So how else would an online system operate? As I've hit upon several times, online waste heater. It would be worth developing this reactor if all you did with it was eat the waste, the spent fuel, in the parking lots. You know, if you just wanted to throw away all that heat and do nothing with it, you still probably want to get rid of the thousands and millions of pounds of spent fuel. I would imagine you probably don't want to saddle our neighbors in Nevada with it probably couldn't even legally do it. So that'd be a good reason to develop this technology. We can also develop a once-through system, a completely sealed system where you don't add fuel or take anything out of it. It's like a giant battery. They can last 60 years. At the end of 60 years, you'd pull it out, you'd send it somewhere that knows how to handle it, like Sandia National Labs. The salt is ionic. It never goes bad. Billions of years of stability in that salt. You get to reuse it over and over in the new systems. The stainless steel, the Hastelloy, it's all reusable. You can recycle everything in there, even the thorium and leftover uranium and neutronics can be used in, in, in medical and industrial processes. And of course, I just mentioned the mobile 10 watt, megawatt Ford operating power system. Let's think about this just one second here, and I'll wrap it up and open myself up for uh, uh, questions and commentary and uh, praise. I'm sure it's just going to come my way. <laughs> but, uh, but let's talk about, look at the past to see where our future might be going. Now that's called uh, the de Havilland Comet up there, right? America wasn't the best builder of jet airplanes after World War II. England was. And that was the world's first commercial jet aircraft. And it was kind of a really good looking airplane, if you ask me. Had some problems? Yeah, they crashed all over. They did like to crash. <laughs> and that's why England, big part of England, does not have a, a jet air, air. You know, they don't, they're part of Airbus, so they got something, you know, that's not completely gone. but. Mostly gone. Uh, any of you remember when the Zenith factory was here in Chicago? Yep. It's not here anymore. How about Amana? Amana, named after the German folks that moved to Iowa. Think any uh, appliances are being made by the Amana Germans in Iowa anymore? How about the Maytags? The other Germans. They're not making appliances anymore. These things are all being made where? They're being made by these guys to feed our insatiable thirst for this stuff. But on top of that, those aren't our guys. And every day, you know, maybe not every day, but certainly once a month, I have to witness a production line being shut down and moved to some other place, Mexico, China. I have to watch people that have perfectly good work ethics and maybe not a tremendous amount of education, you know, or hard working, honest folk that just want to earn a decent living lose their jobs because we can't make stuff here anymore, supposedly. Yeah, we so unless we, unless we start doing things that encourages companies to locate here, like provide them with rare earths, pri provide them with cheap, safe, vastly abundant energy, we're going to lose that base level the pyramid of our society sits on. That base level of adding value to goods in order to create a society that we want to live in. I think, I believe in us, man. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm spending a Saturday night, and I'm so glad that you are here spending a Saturday night. Because I really believe that, you know, y'all are the future of energy. And we can all make this work together. We can make this a country we all believe in, and a Western society that we all want to be part of. So thank you very much for your kind patience.
and brought it in under the wire, 54 minutes. <laughs> All right. Start. Yes, sir. As knowledgeable as you sound. Do you want to so talk in the mic or just want me to repeat the question? Well, I'm, I've got a loud enough voice on the wager, but uh, that's something. You can keep that on because I might refer to the pictures. Uh, okay. Well, I can see the No, no. This works. Brown, don't use two microphones. All right, forget it. No. Just turn it off. No. Yeah. It's like we're getting the transmission to the station. Okay. And I'll repeat it. If, I'll right. ask you yeah. if everyone yeah. heard it. All right. Anyway. Um, all right, as loud, Jeff. As you sound, or with all the details that you went into, I'm going to wager that you've heard the Price Anderson Act. Yes, go on. Okay. Um, and what I'm wondering, given your assurances that these things are safe as safe can be, can you imagine any of the folks who would get involved with this in terms of actually pulling me up? Can you imagine these folks saying, all right, we don't need the indirect subsidy of Price Anderson on us. So we would we would be supportive of a repeal, so to speak, of the Price Anderson insofar as it applies to Thorium, so that any insurance deal does that Price Anderson put a cap on damages if a new plant blew up or whatever. Well, we'll build thorium plants and we're going to take our chances for people suing us for as much as they could possibly sue us for since we know <coughs> we're confident that things ain't going to blow up so it ain't going to matter. Is that so you're, you're, you basically would you think that operators of future molten salt reactors would be have enough confidence to self insure? Yeah. Well, or to get insurance in the normal right. process, sure. as opposed yeah. to this truncated yeah. thing. Right. Right. You could easily. You could, you could. We talk about this quite a bit, actually. You know, we talk about the. Uh, uh, you know, we, we support a lot of. Well, not a lot. I wish we could support more, but we do support research, and we support people doing work in this area. And uh, um, one of the things that we want to support uh, more is the actuarial. Uh, basis on how you would insure one of these facilities and uh, you know so far it looks pretty good you know there's a lot of known technologies a lot of stuff that is in there is not it's not new and exotic the chemistry is well known the uh, the Hastelloy N is a uh, is an alloy that was invented for the original molten salt reactor and is now in every single jet engine in the world you know it's a and so we believe that you could very easily do the, the sort of the actuarial work to say, you know, these are the statistical failure rates for one of these things, and this is, this is what the failure mode would be for one of these things. You know, that, that, you know you'd, you'd have to, the NRC, if you did it domestically, you know, we're pretty sure the Chinese aren't doing this stuff. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you would do failure mode analysis where, like, today, you know, they do like on a light water reactor, they do a, a test called a loss of coolant test. And, you know, we just saw a big loss of coolant test in, in Fukushima, and <laughs> it didn't pass very well. You know, so it's like, uh, it's like, but the, the thing is with a, with a molten salt reactor, the fuel is the coolant, right? So, you know, you sit, that's why it needs its own set of regulations, as you say, they say, well, what are you going to do if you lose your coolant? Like, well, then if you lose the coolant, you lose the fuel, and it stops reacting. Like, well, what happens if you lose your coolant? It's like, I just told you, the coolant is the fuel. You know? So it's a completely different paradigm. You know, I, I always call it opposite land. Solid fuel is a mirror image of liquid fuel. It's so opposite of how they, when you lose your coolant in a solid fuel reactor, really bad stuff happens. When you lose the coolant in a liquid fuel reactor, it's just, yeah, it's over. You know, it just goes dormant. You know, I mean, so that that's just one example I could bore you to death. Uh, yes, sir. Here, I'll, I'll hand him the microphone. I probably don't need it like you do, but... Okay, John, thanks for your presentation. You described the Thorium Energy Alliance as, quote, an advocacy organization composed of engineers, scientists, and concerned citizens, unquote. I've got a two-part question for you. Does your group get any funding from the nuclear industry? Part two, are any of your members connected in any way with the nuclear power or electrical utility industries? Uh, 
man, I wish we got money from the nuclear power industry. <laughs> you know, then I wouldn't have to spend all my own. No, uh, um, the biggest amount of money that we've gotten so far is from uh, uh, some, uh, some large users of electricity, like internet companies that I'm not going to, you know, you can take a guess, <laughs> but, but I sort of, you know, you know, insure them some modicum of, yeah. <laughs> and it's actually, it's not the companies themselves, it's a private, I, sh I should say that, it's, it's the, it's, it's private folks, like I'll give you, our second conference was held at Google, and that was at the behest of a lot of folks at Google who learned about the technology, yeah, and so they've supported, you know, these private individuals mm -hmm. who just happen to work there have supported our work, and and we do have a couple members, uh, uh, Amron, uh, who's uh, down south, Amron has uh, given us some support and uh, and helped us do some lobbying in, in Washington in terms of trying to educate uh, folks like Harry Reid about, you know, you don't have to have Yucca Mountain if you do this. Um, Westinghouse has sent a couple people to our conferences, but I wouldn't exactly say they're members, but so we get a little bit. Here. Well, wait a minute. Now, what's the second? Is it you have scientists and engineers. Right. Are they affiliated, involved any other way? You're talking the first part. Oh uh, well. Well, we got, uh, we got, a, we got uh, most of the scientists are academics, as you can imagine. So, we got a couple guys from U of I who are good members, like Magdi Raghav and Purdue. The the you know the usual suspects, the the, the twenty nuclear engineering schools. In the United States, like the MIT nuclear engineer. Yeah, no one from MIT. No one from. But nope. we got a couple. No, nah, we got a couple guys from Knoxville, a couple guys from Atlanta, Purdue, University of Texas, U of I, obviously Madison. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, my my question. Uh, you're coming from a hard science background. You've given us a lot of science and given us stellar observations of this form of energy. Uh, so uh, I have a two-part question for you. Sure. Uh, coming from the same perspective, hard science. What what is the what's the the drawbacks? What's the what's the best negative attack against your positions? And then if you can give us another layer, what what's the political negative attack? I mean, you're you're, you're giving us something that sounds wonderful. Why isn't it implemented now? If right. okay, you get the problem. yeah, you get the <laughs> so you get the you get the you get the question that's always asked question award there. You know. So why aren't we doing this? This stuff's really good, right? Um, it's like Lala Lab, you're describing why is it here? Yeah. Well, I hinted at it a little bit. Um, let me uh, let me go up here. So this guy, Alan Weinberg, right? He was part of the atomic bomb program, and he invented the light water reactor, which arguably let us make the atomic bomb. And he's the one who argued, hey, we, you know, we should have a thorium future, not a uranium future. And so you start to see these, like, parallel tracks. You know, you can give a lot of credit to inertia. They have had ten years of light water reactors by this point. And even though they knew darn well that that wasn't a good civilian reactor, they're like, hey, we're not going to, we just spent a quarter of the nation's GDP. We're going to, you know, we're not going to you know, reinvent the wheel with this thing again, Alvin. We're going to put the, we're going to implement this as is. So that's one thing that happened. Just stupid inertia took us there. And then after the very successful MSRE experiments, it wasn't really using much money. I mean, even in the 60s, it was something like 30 million a year, some really small amount compared to like the plutonium research. Because what you have to remember is back in the 60s, we thought we were running out of uranium. We thought we were running out of plutonium. And we're building, you know, a thousand bombs a year, man. We were, we needed that stuff. At least, in a, you know, that's what the military thought. So that was another thing. They said, hey, these things eat uranium and plutonium. You know, they don't make it. You know, whereas a light water reactor makes vast amounts of plutonium. So. So that was another thing that went against it. it. You know, it was eating the thing that they wanted. They they didn't want a reactor that could you know consume plutonium. They wanted reactors that could breed plutonium. So all the money was taken away, and this poor guy got fired for supporting this thorium wow. civilian program up until the early 70s. Nixon fired him. Uh, Newt Mill or not Newt. Uh, 
Milton, Milton Shaw. Milton Shaw, Shaw yeah. fired Alvin Weinberg, Glenn Seaborg, the father, you know, one of the fathers of the nuclear navy. They, and they took that pathetic little $30 million and slammed it into this insane program called the Fast Breeder Reactor. And the Fast Breeder Reactor was just a barely under control nuclear bomb is what it, what it amounted to. And it was a complete, utter failure. It, uh, it, to show you how big of a failure it was, it was Reagan who finally canceled the program. Even he was like, damn, that thing's going to kill us. You can't look at it. You know, so, so, and by then, all the, all the, so now here's another trick. So every single nuclear reactor built up until the late 80s was one off. It was ridiculous. Where the French decided early on, we're going to have three reactor designs, big, medium, small. Every single one of our nuclear reactors was custom built. Every valve was custom built. Every, literally every bolt was practically one off. And so they, they were just ridiculous, hard to make, hard to maintain. And so what happened was, then you get Three Mile Island, but everyone's like, well, Three Mile Island, put stab, you know. You're describing a political angle. No, I'm just trying to tell you how, how it Can died. you give us a hard science? What, what is the critical uh, well, argument there. against uh, this energy? That's well, <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, well, I'll just finish real right. quick. The, 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 uh, so even before Three Mile Island, contracts were being canceled and stuff. So that's what happened. Then we went into 30 years of, you know, just we ran the fleet we had and kept it running. And so, so I'll tell you, there, if you want, like, engineering problems that I see, <coughs> You know, these things, these things still have some, some gas issues. I think that's the biggest problem, you know. And it's just it's an engineering problem. It's like, how do you deal with containing the gas? Well, some people say you don't do anything with it. You just seal the whole system and just let it be. You know, that's a one engineering solution. You know, it's called the nuclear battery concept. You know, where you'd have this huge battery, essentially. You know, but, so there's things like it runs at 800 degrees. Valves don't work real good at 800 degrees. So the question is, do you even put any valves in the system? Do you create a system that has no valves at all? You know, it's that sort of discussion that we have. Same thing with like the pump. We'll just go up here a little bit. That pump, you can see it's pretty smoking, you know, a pump running at 800 degrees Celsius. How long can you keep a pump running at 800 degrees Celsius? That's a hot ass pump, you know? So, so there's things like that. I mean, there's some real world engineering problems, but Nothing insurmountable. I mean, hell, we invented Hastel AN just to build this thing, and now Hastel AN is in every single jet engine in the world. Next question, Bonnie Blue. Um, so here, here, I won't give you the microphone so everyone can hear you. Oh, okay. Terrence. Right. Happy host. Can I pay you right now? Um, so Bill Gates is supposedly in China are, are building some supposedly safe reactors. Yeah, that's ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, because, you know, one week we're, sure. we're hearing that's safe. Sure, you want me to tell you about safe. the reactor there? Yeah, but one, one week we're hearing that's safe, now we're hearing this is safe. You well, know, how are we supposed to know? I have a two-part question. Okay. How are we supposed to know what's really safe? Okay. And then number two, uh, I want to know if the, if the thorium could eat the fuel at Fukushima. Because you said thorium. I'll answer your uh, second okay. question first. Yeah, it could, okay. the, a, a molten salt reactor could process the wet stored fuel that's at Fukushima. So why doesn't anybody into think what? of it? What are, what's the, you say it just eats well, it, into what? What does it make? Well, it, uh, it makes energy. And so the, the atoms, you know, are literally devolved into, you know, the, there's a thing called a decay chain, right? And so, like, this building we're in has made, got some concrete in it, right? And so the concrete has some thorium in it, and the thorium is decaying, letting off radon gas, and then the radon gas turns into lead. So that's what I mean by eating it. Now, that's just natural and very... You know, that takes about 80 days from the first time to the last inert thing. You know, so it's a fairly quick process. You know, it's not, you know, everyone's like, it's going to last 10,000 years. But it's, you know, not everything happens like that. So, so you, for instance, I'm not the guy to ask to, like, recite decay chains, but you would literally decay, the plutonium would decay into whatever, and then that would decay down and down what? until... Got to something like bismuth 213, mm -hmm. which is known to cure cancer, which we have none of anymore. We are out of it. 
And uh, so uh, plutonium, plutonium uh, two thirty nine. Yeah. Is every every spaceship uses plutonium two thirty nine in their batteries, and we have none left. So we <laughs> these are things we need if we want to explore space and cure cancer. Uh, I'm sorry. What was the first part? Of, oh, okay. So Bill Gates. So you can you can you know they they talk about reactor designs and generations, right? So that thing in Fukushima was a boiling water reactor, yeah. like a second generation maybe, you know, reactor. The things that are like in Byron, those are second generation too. Those are just plain old stuff a rod into a big crock pot and mm -hmm. boil the hell out of water, mm -hmm. you know. So third generation is like I don't even I can't even give you an example. <laughs> well, Maybe third, they're building one in um, Savannah River. Well, okay, so Vogel in, in, Vo in Vogel in Vogel Georgia, you could call the AP one thousand a third generation, and that's because they put a half million gallon swimming pool above it. You know, and and so the the, the key question you want to ask if you ever ask somebody like, what's really a safe reactor? Go to them and say, is it walk away safe? And the uh, and the guys at uh, the guys at uh, Vogel and the Westinghouse folks making the AP one thousand, they'd say, "Oh yeah, man, you can if things happen, you can walk away from it." And then you go, yeah, "For how long?" Mm -hmm. And you go, "Oh, for like three days." And then you better have your power back on, and you better start refilling those tubs, you know, the water. Yeah. So it's safer, but it's not safe. So that molten salt reactor. You know, if it's like that show, you know, the world without us, you know. If humans disappeared, you know, if you literally walked away from that thing, that thing would just sit there and run until it froze up. You know, it use eventually it would use up all the fuel and the salt and it would just turn into a solid block of salt. So what about Bill Gates? So Bill Gates is developing a thing called a traveling wave reactor. And the traveling wave reactor was this idea that, the, you know, the visual idea was that it would be like a giant fire log. And you'd literally light one end of the log. And as the, the reaction wave went through the log, it would breed its own fuel. And so the, the leading edge of the wave would, would breed. Well, it's just, it's, it's not going to work. They admitted it. It's not. So now what they're left with, if you want to take notes, but what they're, what they're left with doing is they're going to, make what amounts to a, a new version of the can-do reactor, which the Canadians already had. And that is a safe reactor. The can-do reactor is a great reactor. Is that a walk-away reactor? It's not that good, <laughs> but it's, it's really good and it's very robust. And they're not allowed to sell them here in the United States. How crazy is that? So, that's not something. Hey, uh, anybody else? Oh, I'm sorry, Aaron. Did you have a question? Okay. I'm still. You know, your previous, your question one before the lady there was about, you answered it at, at like why America didn't build this reactor, basically. But, and that was an explanation was we needed the byproducts to make nuclear bombs for the competition with Earth, etc. But why didn't anybody else go down this road? They didn't have. Well, you know, like some, you said, you know. we had a lot of money invested in this process, sure. but the Germans didn't, the well, French, sure. the, the Australians, why didn't anybody go down this road? That's an awesome question. Fantastic. So why did, why did anyone develop this thing? You know, okay, so I gave you a reason why the United States didn't. But what I can refer you to is, is that same question is, why isn't anyone but China on this entire planet making rare earths? I mean, if they're so readily available, literally, we could walk outside and, you know, I could scrape some dust off the sidewalk and I could get you a little bit of rare earth. Rare earths aren't rare. It's just an oddball name. It's stuck with from the 1800s. <laughs> so rare earths are really common, right? So if they're so common, why doesn't anybody mine them and, and process them, especially since the prices of rare earths have gone up like seven to ten times in the last year? Why? Oh, well, I'll tell you why. Because, and this should make you sort of proud, the rest of the world looks to the United States for guidance. You know, we get really down on our country. We're like, we're idiots. We don't know how to do shit anymore. We're dumbasses. And all our industry's leaving. We don't know anything. Well, if you think that about, you know, this country, the whole rest of the world still thinks, man, the United States must know something. If they're not developing that, we're not developing that. If they're not mining rare earths and processing stuff because they get thorium, then we're not going to process rare earths because we don't want to have to deal with this stuff. 
You know, it's it's even Malaysia. You know, I don't want to hit you with millions of slides, but you can look up a company called Linus Metals just spent almost a billion dollars building a rare earth refinery in Malaysia, and even the Malay government literally said, "Hey, hey." If the United States isn't processing rare earths, why should we let you process rare earths in our country? There must be something about this. And that's, honest to God, the explanation. France didn't develop molten salt reactors because they didn't, they, the United States wasn't. They're like, well, hell, they must know something. You know, same thing with like England and now Japan did try. Japan got really far with their Fuji reactor, which was their version. But they, uh, uh, so some countries tried, and there's a thing out there called the FHR, which is the, the high temperature reactor, which is still not very good because it's a solid fuel reactor that uses salt as a coolant instead of water. So it's this stupid hybrid. It's like, just go to the liquid fuel. You know, why do this in between stuff? But that's, that's the explanation. I mean, it sounds nuts, but the rest of the world really respects it. <laughs> Here, I'll let this. There you go, sir. Has anybody thought about applications of about five to ten thousand kilowatts, not megawatts, but kilowatts, and mobile, mobile applications of five to ten thousand kilowatts? Well, there's a there's sort of a minimum size that they can be. I mean, there's been the smallest I've ever heard proposed was a little over one megawatt. Um, so that that would be the smallest part because you got to remember you got to have a certain cross section and you got to have a certain amount of stuff happening. So the optimal size for one of these things is probably 10 to 100 megawatts. And but that's still pretty mobile. I mean, a 10 megawatt system would easily fit in this room. So that's kind of mobile. Charlie. Yeah, John. Uh, there you go, sir. We've had previous speakers. Um, Ed Ponder used to come here and talk, and he had a machine about as big as this room that you could take, throw a cow, an old couch in, and he said on the other end would all come out gasoline. Sure. <laughs> and then we had another guy with some sort of... Uh, like a waste energy plasma oven? Well, these were tubes that were going to go with the tide and produce energy for the United States. Yeah, way better. But the point I'm going to like to get to, this is a nuclear reactor. It produces stuff up to 800 degrees. It's got a half-life of 200 years. And that stuff isn't vanilla ice cream. No. But <laughs> yeah. Is it really now? So what's the question exactly? I don't think this is, this is quite the benign machine that you were telling us it is. Okay. So let's talk about... Let's talk about the price we pay for energy, right? I'm it's not about, benign. I'm worried about Charles. Yeah. Well, I don't know if I want one next to my house in Bridgeport. No, I would want one next to my house in Harvard, though, because let's look. Nothing's benign. Our life kills people, okay? The way we make energy kills animals and people. The molten salt reactor would kill the least. How about that? Is that blunt enough for you? <laughs> this, this precious, oh so green solar cell, these people are rioting their communist government who would just kill them as soon as look at them because their babies are being born deformed and dead so that we can have lovely green energy here, huh? That's really green. Look at how much resources and weight and energy. You know, that steel doesn't come from nowhere. The vast, there's a, in, the, in the energy business, we talk about the energy budget of something. So how much energy does it take to make a solar cell? Did you know up until a couple of years ago, no solar cell would ever make enough energy in 30 years to make up the energy that went into making it? It takes 15 years of almost constant use for a windmill to make back enough energy to equal the amount of energy that went into it. So a windmill has to spin for 15 years before it puts out enough energy to make up for the amount of energy it took to produce the windmill. Okay? 
And by the way, while that thing's spinning and causing people to have practically aneurysms because it's flashing in their windows and the birds are flying into them with bird strikes, oh, okay. you know, and, and you're getting turtles in the desert that are being baked alive by the solar concentrators and you have salmon that can't swim to their spawning grounds because they've got a hydroelectric dam in the way, when you've got geothermal energy that causes earthquakes outside of San Francisco. There's no thing, there's no free lunch. There's no energy that just comes out of nowhere without tremendous cost. Tremendous cost. Okay? And so we have in this thing the least amount of cost by far compared to the amount of output and useful energy. I hope that explains my, you know, it's not my position, that's just the facts, baby. So, <laughs> so we have to accept danger? We yeah. have to accept danger. If you want to live in the fourth century, that's great. You know, if you want to burn cow dung in a little clay oven and try and, you know, cook the pigeon that you caught that morning with a snare, you know, I mean, that is the only sort of culture that doesn't walk very heavily upon the earth. Uh, thank you. So, where are the resources of thorium in the United States, and uh, what is the extraction process like, and how much would it cost to, you know, set it up at a significant level? Okay. Good point. So, uh, as I told you, the uh, you get thorium naturally from rare earth. Uh, you get thorium naturally from uh, the, the refining of rare earth, right? And so, the United States annually throws away 500 percent of all the rare earths its industry would need. Okay, so the the main sources of rare earths right now are tailings lakes from iron mines. Uh, there is one purpose-built mine in California for mining just rare earths. And then there is, for instance, a phosphate mine that in Florida that mines phosphate for fertilizer, and they throw approximately 100% of the USA's <laughs> annual use of rare earths out every year in a tailings lake. <laughs> How about that? So you find the broadest spectrum of rare earths in a mineral called monazite. There's other minerals out there like apatite, but monazite has the heavy rare earths, which do the most interesting things. And with that, you get up to somewhere between 7 and 14 percent of that monazite by weight is thorium. The other place you find a lot of monazite sand is on the beaches of Miami, uh, India has vast amounts of thorium-bearing uh, monazite sand, and Brazil has huge amounts of thorium. And, the, you know, the old joke is if you go to tan on the beach in Miami, you can get a suntan from both sides. <laughs> <laughs> the sand, you know, the monazite sand in Florida is very rich. It's about 12% uh, by weight uh, thorium, and the sand in uh, Brazil is up to 14% thorium. It's an amazingly rich uh, mineral. Does that answer your question, ma'am? Okay, so oh, oh, so the processing of it. So once you get that mineral, right, so you grind that mineral into uh, basically like a baby powder consistency. And the way they used to process it was was horrendous. They would, they would basically dissolve it in nitric acid and use a filtering process where they'd have to pass it through the filters like 30,000 times. I mean, God. Yeah, and that is actually still uh, how China does some of their rare earth processing. There's uh, new ways that are substantially cheaper. If you remember, I said Linus Metals spent almost a billion dollars building a rare earth refinery in uh, Malaysia. There's a proposal for a rare earth refinery in the United States with the same capacity that would be exceedingly cleaner, use no nitric acid, and cost about a hundred million dollars. So it's fairly cheap. Who has that and where is it? Uh, it is proposed to go, one of the proposed places that such a place could go would be uh, 
like by St. Louis, so it's in the center of the country, so that iron mines and other mines that have these tailings could deliver their tailings, which are just garbage to them, and they could be turned into, you know, very useful. So, so the point is, you don't open up a rare earth mine. Nobody would open up a rare earth mine. They'd be, it'd be, it's ridiculous. We have mines for iron, mines for phosphate. You know, we have all sorts of mines that are already creating. So it's a It's a right now they consider it a waste. You know, and I could, I could tell you more about why they consider it a waste, but you know, they don't see value in it. it all has to do with like the crazy regulatory system from the 1954 Atomic Energy Act. Martin, you had your hand up before. I would sort of a follow up to the, the question there. I find it incredible to believe that nobody wants to pursue this idea because they think the lead in the U.S. surely was not true of France after three mile dollars, three mile island. They didn't really discontinue their nuclear pro their, their program uh -huh. at that point. So, so he's, he's sort of a follow up. He's asking, you know, I can't believe that nobody's pursuing this. And, <laughs> and w what I would say is that now they are. You know, now China is spending a billion dollars on it. You know, the, the entire whole nuclear, you know, from front to back sort of went into dormancy for the last 30 years. You know, Riva did a little bit of work in recycling uh, uranium. They spent $35 billion building a uranium recycling facility. That was probably the biggest advance in nuclear energy in the last 30 years. So now, now there's sort of a renaissance where people are like, hey, you know, all those projects that went dormant in the 70s, let's look at those again. And so Brazil is willing to spend a half a billion dollars, uh, four and a half billion dollars will be spent in South Africa, uh, China's spending one to three billion dollars, Canada will put a billion dollars into it, so it's coming back. Well, it's not, because that's all you need. Remember, this, this thing is not that complex. We're, not talk we're talking about chemistry that we know, and geometry that we know, and metallurgy, so it's, it Why doesn't... Why is everybody hurt. only spending a half a billion dollars to do it at that point? Because that's all they need to spend. What they don't, these things don't cost, these things cost two million dollars a megawatt to build. Fairly linearly, a 10 megawatt, re, a 10 megawatt hot cell, this is considered a hot cell, a 10 megawatt hot cell would probably cost about 20 million dollars to make. Now, that doesn't include all the stuff on the outside, but just this thing, just the generator, so a 100 megawatt one would cost about $200 million. Very linear and, uh, and very reasonable because not a lot of complexity, as you can see. You know, it's a, you can literally follow the plumbing. There, 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 there. I'm trying to follow the money. Right? It doesn't appear to me that there's a significant amount of money that's a barrier to doing this. No, there is. The money, money is not the barrier to doing this. Why hasn't it been done? It, it hasn't been done because the regulatory issue at hand is in the 1954 Atomic Energy Act. That's this country. Yeah, that's just that's the, the whole world, honey. I'm sorry. The, 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 the whole world. Okay. The, the whole world follows. We have we have a thing called the one two three agreement, and the one two three agreement. If you if you want to look up the one two three, the one two three agreement since the 1950s has basically held the entire world to follow our standards. Oh, come on. <coughs> the entire world that followed our standards when Pakistan and India built nuclear bombs? No, and that's why when, they when got the... When uh, built nuclear bombs, <coughs> is any of this stuff following our standards? Well, there's nobody who looks at things and says, wait a minute, this is a competitive advantage. We can come in here and knock the world out of its ass. So what's, what's happening <laughs> right now is that <laughs> countries who've signed these one, two, three agreements and who look to us for guidance through the 1954 Atomic Energy Act and the NRC are starting, sir, to say we need you to make a decision, America. And what is America's decision? The decision is no decision. And so what they are saying, countries like Canada are saying, forget it. We're going to go against your will, America, and develop our own. India is developing their own. They're spending $1 billion in India against our wishes. China, against our wishes. France, against our wishes. So, sir, they are developing this stuff now. We just aren't doing it here in the United States. And, and, I hope and, that explains they, it. They to do it years ago when they were talking about nuclear bombs against our wishes. Bob Matter has the next question. Yeah, uh, is that a four? Well, you don't need the mic. 
Oh. Is, that a, is that a photo of the, the plant in India that's opening next year? In, uh, no, no, this is, this is from about 1969, and this was the actual molten salt reactor experiment at Oak Ridge National Lab. And you can see these, these big uh, concrete beams support uh, big plates that went over here. And this is one of the few times they had the plates off of the reactor. Uh, this, was, this was the running reactor, and it ran for 22,000 hours uh, without any failures. Yeah, uh, second part of my question is, uh, how do they, uh, you know, refine thorium? So if I have, this is a, I have these big mounds of uh, dirt from my gold mining operation. <laughs> right. How do I uh, now get the thorium out of there? What do they have to do to get that out? So when when you got like like you said these tailings, I have to look. I'm not sure if gold mining actually produces much, but it probably does. Um, but like iron mining produces a lot of these tailings, phosphate mining. <laughs> Tin mining, uh, so they they tend to produce a lot of these monazite sands and apatite, you know, and these other. What's that? What's a monazite sand? Well, in a monazite sand, a uh, monazite is a mineral that contains a very broad array of rare earth metal, and also uh, monazite in particular has a large amount of thorium in it. So when you, what happens, sir, is when you break these. When you break these sands down through whatever process, whether it's mechanical or chemical or some combination, usually what happens is the, min the, the metals fall out in the order of their weight. So when you start dropping metals out, the first thing that drops out from the monazite would be thorium oxide. Boom. Thorium oxide's ready to go as is, you know, so thorium oxide is a usable material so it doesn't need to be enriched or further refined into a pure metal it's uh, it's it's uh, it's ready to use so you, there's no such thing as highly enriched thorium <laughs> it's just it's ready to go right out of the process and so like with the monazite sand it'd be something like thorium then iron calcium then you'd get stuff like neodymium samarium Lucitinium, you know, and they would just fall out, literally, sort of like literally fall out in piles in the process. Yeah, I, I'm still not clear about exactly what the fuel is for this reactor is. Uh, uh, you kind of been vague about that. Thorium um, itself is not uh, breaking into other elements. It's not uh, right. Right. It's, so if you remember, so I can't you're using uranium and plutonium from these spent fuel rods, you're yep. counting on that. Yeah. So it's not the thorium, it's the fuel. So no, the thorium is the fuel, so imagine it's like it's like the candle. You just No, okay, so you, the candle can't light itself, right? Okay, so it's what not you the fuel, it's not fissioning. So it's right. uranium plutonium. That and think of that as like a match. So you actually so once it starts, your... it'll breed. Uranium it's considered a breeder uranium. reactor, okay? So what happens is when the thorium, I mean the thorium's not in there for nothing. So when the thorium is in there, it doesn't have the one extra neutron, right? So the classic cycle, what, what the classic cycle, the let me just say, answer you, through. sir. The classic cycle is you put a little bit of uranium, a little tiny bit of uranium in compared to the overall mass of the fuel salt. And that uranium is like a match lighting a candle or a campfire. You know, you can't say, it, oh, well, I'll pull the match out of the campfire and the whole campfire okay, so goes out. you're using right? the free neutrons from the right. fissioning of the uranium and the plutonium to, uh, to excite the uh, right. thorium from 232 up to 233. To 233, yes. Why didn't you explain that as part of your talk? Well, I wasn't trying to get as far deep into the weeds as that, but if you yeah, want It's to. not the weeds, that's just an explanation yeah. of what the process oh. that you're yeah. talking so this about. Is, so, yes, so this is the classic cycle that you just described. Yes. Once you get... Once you get a neutron source, and I did describe in my talk that you can use uranium or plutonium or even cesium or some of the other, if it's got extra neutrons, you can use anything. For instance, the French and Fermi lab don't want to use anything at all. They don't, you don't have to. You could use a neutron source like the accelerator at Fermi lab, and you could use the neutrons that the accelerator spits out through the neutron spallation source. It's called neutron spallation, and you could just hit 
a pile of thorium with a beam of neutrons. So you don't need yeah, now this is this is you don't need uranium or plutonium at all. But if you want to get the knock-on beautiful effect of using up some plutonium and using up some spare uranium to act as that match, then once the once the thorium goes to the classic cycle, thorium-232 becomes uranium-233, uranium-233 gives up a neutron, becomes uranium-232 again, and it breeds its own fuel. As a matter of fact, it, uh, it you know, so it's, it's, it's almost like a fusion process in a, in a way. But it's, it's considered a breeder reactor. Once you start it, it's self-sustaining. But if you shut it down, you'd need to start it up with something again. You, know, you would need another match to get it going. So whether that match is a an accelerator at Fermilab or a little tiny amount of uranium or plutonium, I don't care. It, but it needs neutrons to start. Is that, is that okay? I don't want to leave you. Now oh. well, you've actually explained so, it. So. Okay. Um, but that doesn't sound like You want the microphone, man? No. It doesn't sound like it's eaten up a bunch of spent fuel from all of our nuclear reactors. You're saying a tiny little bit of uranium, a tiny little bit of plutonium is needed as a okay, catalyst. Okay, so, so a tiny bit is all you need to start it, but you can feed it far more. Yeah. You know, so it's, <laughs> imagine if you want to keep using that bonfire analogy, you only need one match to light a well-made bonfire and it'll go. But if you've got, you know, a big pile of old newspapers, you could keep feeding the newspapers in and it'll burn the newspapers as it burns the wood. So that's where that comes in. It, it'll consume the other actinide wastes and the other spent fuels as much as you want in and that you, process. And what, what's the waste that comes out of this? What? Oh, well, you, you might get uh, uh, some radioactive rare earths that can be used for different industrial processes. You might get bismuth-213, uh, plutonium-238. I mean, there's a there's a wide array, but one thing that will make you happy is you're not going to wind up with huge amounts of radioactive zirconium from the casings, because there is no casing, it's liquid. And you will wind up with one one thousandth the, you know, quote unquote waste that, uh, that a solid fuel reactor would create. I don't need the microphone, and mine's a follow-up to the last two questions. Again, you said that thorium cannot be used in a nuclear weapon, granted. But thorium, I want to make sure, and again, thorium is fertile, not fissionable. Right. And I'm finally glad you corrected and clarified yourself on that point. You said uranium-235 or plutonium-239, they're required to start and maintain a chain reaction. The question is, doesn't the use of enriched uranium or plutonium in thorium fuel have proliferation implications. Well, actually, the, the classic thing you would start it on is is your uranium-233. And the only eight known tons of uranium-233 are about to be uh, destroyed. <laughs> We're about to spend $500 million destroying uranium-233. And uranium-233 is a, a notoriously difficult uh, material to handle. But because you need so little of it to start one of these things that it would be the classic material to start because it would be pure and it would and it wouldn't leave you know it would it would consume itself just like the match you could never find the match that started the fire you know it would it would completely be consumed in the fuel burning process now uranium-235 that's throwing off you know that's highly enriched that's throwing off uh, neutrons, but you're using it up also. You're not creating new uranium-235. So, now there's there's folks that would say, well, hey, you know, you could sort of siphon off excess uranium-233 off of one of these reactors. But I just said it's it's really, really hard stuff to, to handle, you know. So, if you siphoned off somehow, you know, enough uranium-233 without killing yourself, you know, it, it would uh, it wouldn't get you much anywhere. You'd probably wind up killing yourself yeah. trying to make a bomb or mm -hmm. something. I, I mean, I I don't even know. It would be so much easier to go to like, you know, th there's so much other low hanging fruit in the world. You know, you could I could buy ten thousand smoke detectors. You know, if I wanted to cause a radiological incident, 
and you know set them on fire in Times Square, and I'd be releasing you know all sorts of American, you know, <laughs> you know and people would flip out because all the radar, all the detectors would be going. So it's like, why would you go? Who's going to attack? You know this facility. You know, okay, so somehow you're going to get into this facility, go in there, 800 degrees. Remember, this isn't like, oh, I'm going to stand next to a toaster oven. 800 degrees, spitting out neutrons like crazy. You know, somehow you get in there and somehow siphon off some of this fuel and and do some vacuum distillation on. You know, it's like the the amount of the technical difficulty of doing it is so extreme that why not just go to Russia and bribe a guard at a uh, nuclear weapons facility? <laughs> you know, you'd be a lot better off. <coughs> Tim Bolger. Okay, so let me get this straight. The starter fuel is like uranium, plutonium, or U-233. Yeah. And that releases... Or a, or a neutron beam from okay. an accelerator. And that goes into thorium. That thorium then decays back into uranium-233, yep. which is what sustains the reaction. You have the actual uranium U-233 bringing the reaction and sustaining itself, and the thorium blanket on the outside of that ball of uranium-233 is what's running the plant. The uranium, the thorium decays. Uh, well, the, the, the uranium, would be, uranium would be mixed into the liquid fuel. And then you're starting to get into the whole okay. idea of one, one fluid, two fluid, where you'd have the fuel in the middle, and then you'd have a blanket of unfueled salt surrounding it, sort of like a water jacket on an engine. So basically, though, it's the uranium U-233 that powers the reactor versus the thorium that's the fertile fuel that produces it, correct? Yes. I, okay. I will say yes. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, Charles. Oh, yeah, John, I'm a little confused there. You began, and you said a guy in 1954 had one of these and you showed a picture of it, and then you showed another picture, and then you said, oh, there's an experiment in 69, and then you told us that there's yeah. a research team of 415 Chinese guys, right. and the only thing you got thus far is a cartoon one. <laughs> so where really are we at on this project? Well, 1954 was the Atomic Energy Act. 1956 was the first aircraft reactor experiment. 1959 was the aqueous reactor experiment. And 1965 to 1971 was the molten salt reactor experiment, and it ran continuously for almost six years at full power, so for 22,000 hours. The, uh, that thing is, uh, st still exists, you know, the, that, they're still sitting there at Oak Ridge, and they, they, they haven't run it for a long time, but, you know, it's, it's a real thing. It really ran. The Fuji in Japan was a real thing that they were developing in the 70s and 80s. And the Chinese are not about to, you know, reveal exactly what their particular commercialized version of this reactor is, you know, what its physical embodiment is. But we know for a fact that... Last year, for instance, all foreign nationals that visited Oak Ridge National Lab uh, amounted to 800 people. All the Chinese that visited Oak Ridge National Lab last year was 2,800 people. So the Chinese have flooded Oak Ridge. They're working with Charles Fosberg at MIT and folks at Berkeley, and they're extracting the nuclear patrimony of the United States and exporting it to China so that China can develop their own molten salt reactor. And the Chinese have publicly committed to uh, $3 billion, 450 nuclear engineers to have a working commercialized molten salt reactor <coughs> into production by 2020. And that's a Chinese press release. Uh, and a Chinese uh, memorandum of understanding with Oak Ridge National Lab and uh, the affiliated universities. So, I don't know if that disturbs you, but it disturbs me that 
the nuclear patrimony of the United States is going to support another country that doesn't have our best interest okay. at heart. Isn't Oak Ridge a federal? Yeah. Oak Ridge is a federal, yeah. yeah it's pretty bad. That's why, you know, we get, it's ridiculous that our, it's ridiculous that a national lab is giving away technology to foreign. Absolutely. Let's get it. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. Okay. There you go. You probably explained this, but what is the actual chemical reaction? That's what is going on in here. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so the way the, uh, the way it works again is that uh, the thorium atom is just very, very big atom. It's really big atom. Yep. What's its number? Ninety. And uh, so uh, it's it, you know ninety. It's up there. You know, you, you know hydrogen's one. So good. Uranium's uh, so, ninety-two. Yeah, uranium's ninety-two. Protactinium's ninety-one. So so uh, so thorium's really fat. You know, it's right up there. It's not as fat as as uranium, which is just like sweating neutrons, right? <laughs> Well, so so the thing is, it's it wants to it wants to split, but it can't. It's just it's incapable. It's a very inert atom. It's the half life of thorium is fourteen and a half billion years. It's a long time, you know. The half you know the half life of almost everything else. It's also the highest melting temperature metal. It's a uh, you know so it's got a lot of interesting right. stuff going for it. Uh, Okay. One of the other interesting things, as long as you got me talking about thorium as an element, well, almost every airplane, submarine, missile, what have you, built from the 60s to the early 90s, used thorium, magnesium, and thorium aluminum uh, alloy. It's an amazing material. It's incredibly light, incredibly strong. The nose cones of the Trident missiles and the original Nautilus sub that broke through the Arctic ice, remember that? That was thorium alloy that allowed it to do that. Super light, incredibly strong. Okay. Anyway, so with the reaction, the, the atom wants to split, but it just can't. So what you use is uh, you borrow a neutron from another atom, and that neutron, sort of like a billiard ball, hits it and cracks it open. But by the, you know, by the oddity of nuclear chain reaction, it splits open for a second momentarily turns into, you know, it absorbs that neutron, it momentarily becomes uranium-233, you know, it becomes a different element. <laughs> yeah, and because uranium-233 isn't stable, it throws off its neutron, and it just goes on and on and on, you know, and that's why they call it a chain reaction. Yeah, by when it releases that neutron, a tremendous amount of energy is released when that happens. Okay. And then once it releases the neutron, it returns to being thorium again. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's get go, let's get to rebuttals, Brom. Uh, yeah. Let's get it's it's, it's uh, we, there's going to be questions, but we got to get to rebuttals. Yes, we do. Time for the rebuttals. That's all right. And I'm going to ask you guys to tell me how many people have. Remarks to make. One, two, three, four, five. There's going to be a lot more. Go to about four minutes, Brom. Um, yeah, uh, some of them anyway. Go to four minutes because there'll be more. There probably will be more. Uh, I, I think, uh, I'm going to get five. Five? <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker. Yeah, where's the speaker? He just I think he went maybe. to the bathroom.
Well, no, he didn't go to the bathroom. The waitress took him out. I got a short And I, I will ask you. That's fine. I'm Michael Owens. I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I got a prediction. Critical decision. John, John, I got take a prediction. Because you're going to rebut the rebut. The next four months, uh, excuse me, the next four weeks. My prediction is just a guess. I got no secret sources of information. And remember, I'm a doomsday guy. The Olympics are going to start in two weeks. Actually, on July 27th, which is two weeks from yesterday. And the Olympics go me, for two weeks after that. Excuse me, Brian. Excuse me. The Olympics are going to be held in the city of London, England, which is the capital city of the British Empire. I believe that sometime during the two weeks that the Olympics are being held in London, England, Somebody is going to detonate an atom bomb in the city of London. This could be done by Muslim people who have access to atom bombs, or this could be done by the Central Intelligence Agency, who would then blame it on a bunch of Muslims. But I do believe that sometime during the Olympics, during the two weeks the Olympics are going on, an atom bomb is going to be detonated in the city of London, England, the capital city of the British Empire. That's all I got. Thank you. Now the job's back. First you don't succeed, try, try again. Sorry. Again, my name is uh, Dennis Nelson, and I'm president of uh, Nuclear Energy Information Service, NEIS, which is Illinois Nuclear Power Watchdog Group. Again, thanks, John, for his presentation. Uh, first off, John equates our good life with consuming 40% more electricity than everybody else. We could live the good life by doing better with less, between 44% and 75% less electricity. It, these estimates are based upon research done by the EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, the research arm for the electrical utility industry, and the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is a think and do tank in Snowmass, Colorado. Uh, John said that nuclear reactors are on all the time, but what about refueling, uh, malfunctions, and mishaps? Before moving to the Chicago area in February of 82, I was the energy analyst and resource person for the Breadbasket Alliance in Omaha, Nebraska. I had several public debates on TV and in the Unitarian Church, I was the president of the Nebraska Voice of Energy. Other Voice of Energy groups popped up around the country about the same time. He attempted to pass off the Nebraska Voice of Energy as a local citizens group, just like the Breadbasket Alliance was. He said that he was not a spokesperson for the Omaha Public Power District, OPPD, the local utility which owns and operates the Fort Calhoun Nuclear Station. Now, we at NEIS have renamed Fort Calhoun, Port Calhoun, because of the flooding along the uh, Missouri River. Now, he was a chemical and metallurgical engineer, and he was an employee of Omaha Public Power District, OPPD. And other members were either employees of, or had some kind of connection with, the nuclear power and electric utility industries. My question to John, my first one was not a personal attack, it wasn't irrelevant, it wasn't nitpicky, it gets right to the point. You can try to make yourself look as independent and grassroots as possible, but if the financial biases are there, the emotional biases are there, and the intellectual biases are there, then it really boils down to the same old pro-nuclear cheerleading that I've heard for over 42 years now. I've been working on this stuff. I, I kind of rephrase an expression. If it looks like and sounds like a radioactive duck, then that's what it probably is, is a radioactive duck. Uh, I want to take a close look at the name, Thorium Energy Alliance, underlining the word, emphasizing alliance. Now, John and company have even borrowed, and I'll use the term very loosely, specific wording which we, nuclear-free, inherently safer, and cleaner energy activists, have been using for a long time now. Again, in the agricultural or breadbasket region of the country, Omaha, Nebraska, I lived across the river in Council Plus, Iowa, Breadbasket Alliance, the Clamshell Alliance in New England fighting Seabrook, the Abalone Alliance in California fighting Diablo Canyon, 
and here in the land of Lincoln, the Illinois Sea Energy Alliance, a coalition which NEIS belonged to. In fact, the Safe and Clean Energy Coalition has a nice sounding name that makes it sound like one of our groups, but it's not. It's a front group for the nuclear industry. A thorium fuel cycle is not yet commercially feasible, and the proposed concept poses intractable waste and proliferation problems. Wind power is now commercially feasible, and the problems with siting and noise in certain cases can are being resolved. Plans for the North Star Wind Farm in North Central Iowa are being held up because of transmission. A proposed overhead high voltage direct current transmission line called the Rock Island Clean Line would be 500 miles long. It would go between North Central Iowa and Chicago area, that's us. It would deliver 3,500 megawatts of cleaner and safer wind electricity. This is the equivalent to about three and a half large nuclear reactors. It would update our current outdated electricity grid. It could feed into a regional utility grid that extends from Illinois to New Jersey. And the Rock Island Clean Line could break ground as early as 2014 and service beginning as early as 2016. These are the sorts of priorities that we need to focus upon, not thorium fuel cycle. Thank you very much. Dennis, I'm somewhat surprised that you didn't use, the, maybe the, the, the time got screwed up because someone well, stepped in front of you for these reasons, um, you, you, that you didn't use more of your time to be specific about the nature of the waste and proliferation problems to which you very, only very briefly refer. Those details would make a world of difference to me in this situation here. And I'm tempted to say that until such time as someone shows me either major waste, major waste problems, major proliferation problems, he did try to address your question there, um, or major problems with the total E, what's the acronym, E-R-O-I, um, major problems there, I'm very much more impressed than I expected to be. And as far as with this talk, and his answer to my question about Price Anderson, if it's true that these guys and whoever's going to pony up for this stuff, if those guys would actually be willing to do without the rigging of the market that Price Anderson performed for the nuke for the, for the uranium industry, by my way of thinking, that carries a tremendous amount of weight. Number one, number two. It's worth considering the arguments of guys like Archdruid John Greer, all right, who sweat, and he's probably not the, the, the most important one in this respect, who sweat about the prospect, and Frank and I have talked about this, that it takes, what, a decade or so to get a nuclear plant to stop being dangerous once you turn the damn thing off. I forget if it was a decade or two, whatever it was that we've talked about. Well, we're going to need some energy for a long while to get that done once we get the damn things turned off. And if, if, we, get, if we need thorium plants in neighborhoods, once we run out of oil, which we're going to do, all right, and we're going to, what are we going to do with a level, level of choice? We're going to end up probably with a choice between either polluting the hell out of the air so we can't breathe it no more by doing all the stuff we're doing now and making the water, you know, where you can light a match to it, and make it burn, right? Okay, it's, it's, it's going to be, it looks like to me, the practical choice is going to be a choice between that or doing what these guys are talking about. But one way or the other, we better have a shitload of energy available to do whatever we need to do for that 10 or so years that Frank talks about so that all of the, new, the 400 or so new plants all around the world don't melt down in the interim once those switches are all turned off. So uh, we, I'm surprised Frank hasn't uh, jumped at the bit here to, 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 uh, to comment, but if there's, uh, I want to hear from Frank or whoever what the real rubs are in specifics 
this looks like, given this Bryce Anderson attitude that he showed here, this looks like the best ball game in town in an otherwise a horribly dangerous situation. Imagine 400 Fukushimas all over the damn world, and what's the practical course that anybody has to stop all of those things from going bananas and frying the whole place, especially the northern hemisphere? Uh, I don't know, I have any more time? Well, let's go. Oh, my God, we do have time. Uh, okay. The Arch Druid. John Michael Greer is mentioning is worth mentioning separately in his own right. I can't recommend his site too strongly. He posts once a week on a Wednesday night or Thursday morning. And it involves not only specific talk about specific kinds of issues directly or very closely related to this energy thing, but he's making all sorts of informed judgments about the broader political context and where it's likely to go. Um, and in this last week's post, he made an analogy between our current situation and France circa 1788. Okay. Uh, and uh, in terms of what the elites are, the elites that gave us stuff like Price Anderson. And then back then, when they did that, they were a hell of a lot better than they are now. At least for the most part, they sort of seemed to give a damn. Whereas now, they're even stopping, they're not even bothering going through the motions anymore, really. Uh, you know, they're just, they're, it's like, you know, when, when, in boxing, they call it taking a dive. If those, if those, those of you are familiar with the analogy of where you get hit, and you just fall down because you got paid off to throw the fight. And that's what it looks like these guys are doing. So, and yeah, um, he's, 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 he's well worth reading the comments. The comments on, on his site. It just goes on for days and days after he posts. Um, you know, the, the debate back and forth, the weighing these various factors, um, are well worth it. Are well worth your time. Oh. He doesn't think the thorium thing's going to work. I don't remember him getting very specific as to why. But in these desperate times, I'm tempted to roll the dice on something which, unless someone shows me major problems with stuff like waste, we may have to roll the dice on this thing in the absence. All the other alternatives <coughs> look either grossly inadequate on its face. Arch Druid argues that when it's so we're going to come close to actually keeping this machine going. So that the 400 new plants don't just fry the joint. I was the one that recommended to Charlie that he book Mr. John Coots for a presentation here at the college. About four to five months ago, I had first heard about the thorium reactor from, frankly, his website and some other sources of information that I've learned. And I've been looking all over the internet for research on this topic. And the more I learned, the more I was intrigued. But like any skeptical person, I looked and I dug. I don't know all the answers to this thorium reactor or what's going to work, but the more I learn, the more I agree with Mr. Koontz. We need to do this and pursue this. Now for you, if you're as skeptical as I am, you need to check some stuff out. Now there was an excellent gentleman, his name is Gordon McDonald, who actually taped the uh, conference here at Chicago, who, who has all the technical talks that were given by the main speakers at this conference, and he's got a YouTube channel. Gordon McDowell is a very gifted videographer who takes a lot of these concepts down very well. At the same time, there was also a new author introduced. His name was Richard Martin, who wrote a book called Super Fuel. It was all about thorium and what its implications were, and it gets into much more detail on Alvin Weinberg and Oak Ridge, and it gets into much more detail on rare earth, the rare earth, and he even mentions this in, in some other cases a little bit more about the technical details of the thorium reactors and how they work and what exactly it all is about. And I thoroughly invite you to check this out because the more you learn, the more you're going to be intrigued. The more you learn, the more you're going to see that it is something we can gamble and might be a good, viable alternative and an answer to our environmental and global uh, economic problems. And it's always been like this. Even when England transferred from wood to coal, 
or even when we found petroleum. Because at the time in the mid-1800s, we were on horse carts. We had streets that were, not, that were polluted by animal waste. And petroleum products cleaned up the cities enough to get the streets clean so we wouldn't have animal bunk in the streets. And even now, when London finally went from coal to electric power or started using more cars, their streets were inherently a lot cleaner than the coal-burning stoves they were using in the last century. Now, again, we're at a crossroads. We're going to need power no matter what you talk about. Whether it, and, we, and we're going to need renewables, and we're going to need wind and solar, but it all comes at a cost. This thorium reactor designed nuclear power does come with costs, and I think John was very open about it tonight. But for me, this is the first real viable alternative I've seen that can really power our future society in a way that is inherently clean. Now, it's, you're sure you're going to have waste and proliferation problems, and I think if I'm correct that we'll still have to sequester materials for 500 years, but for the amount of waste that this reactor produces and the amount of byproducts that it produces, it's essentially clean. I invite all of you to check out Richard Martin's book, Superfuel, or at least go to the Thorium Alliance webpage. You will find a lot of good stuff. Thank you. My name is Doug Binkley. I have a degree in physics from the Illinois Institute of Technology, but I'm not any expert on nuclear reactors. So, and I didn't have any time to really look up any of the information about this before I came up. Um, the explanation of exactly what happens with the fuel and everything. Um, uh, I'm gathering that um, when you go from the thorium-232 up to U-233 that uh, maybe what happens is you absorb a couple of neutrons because you have this heavy neutron environment and then you get U-235 and that fissions and that's what causes the uh, power, to the real power to come from the thorium fuel. I'll have to double check that, but I hope that is on the website. Um, but that, what that means is that you do still have these uh, nuclear products that we're worried about that are the problem with Fukushima. Now, um, if our speaker is right um, about the uh, uh, fact that the, uh, uh, the salt, of course, uh, if the reactor uh, has a problem that uh, it just uh, drops into these uh, tanks underground, and um, uh, I guess even if you were next to the ocean and you had a bunch of ocean water go in there, you just have uh, salt water in the um, uh, in the contain the container area underground, which um, if it did not explode or cause uh, hideous gases or something, that uh, perhaps it could be contained, um, and so you would not have a Fukushima or, or Chernobyl situation. Um, I need to look into it further. I'm not uh, positive or negative about this uh, possibility, uh, and um, um, he did bring up a lot of things about. Uh, what the costs are uh, involved in wind and uh, solar, uh, which uh, uh, we need further investigating uh, before we as a society can come to a conclusion about that. There's nothing wrong with pursuing all of these avenues, um, and the thorium reactor, certainly the, um, the benefits of the, the thorium in that it's actually already produced, as he says, in um, um, mining or mining things related to rare earths, uh, which is, uh, again, something that we need to do. I, I found out about rare earths back in uh, 2009, um, and um, if I'd had money to invest, I would have invested in rare earths at that time. It was, came up on the financial programs um, as a, um, something that was um, very uh, timely at that, at that time, and it was pointed out that China was uh, the main uh, uh, producer of rare earths. So. Um, all these things, um, um, I'm, I'm certainly not negative about this uh, reactor. I'm not, I'm not, the reason I'm negative about uh, nuclear power in general is because of the plants that we've had. And uh, it very much disturbs me uh, to hear that there is a possibility that this country has dragged its feet on this uh, investigation of the thorium uh, reactor uh, possibility because of wanting to um, create the inevitability that we have to keep the system of nuclear reactors that we have um, 
in order to uh, uh, keep the uh, uranium and plutonium uh, fuel for nuclear bombs, um, to keep a supply of that. Um, there's, um, there's bizarre theories about why uh, we're doing that, um, even though uh, we have pressure from a president who wants to uh, um, uh, go on the side of non-proliferation and also try to, re uh, in public, wants to reduce the number of nuclear weapons that we have. Um, but uh, there's some force in our government that wants to continue to uh, keep us having these large uh, nuclear weapons, which uh, has been, been pointed out a number of times in our uh, college of complex complexes um, uh, programs that they are highly dangerous to have them around and have them um, in you know missile silos and whatnot. So anyway, uh, thanks for the presentation. Got no more rebutters. My goodness. Oh, oh. Charles. Uh, Bill, go ahead. Go ahead, Bill. Do you do You guys are at a loss for words tonight. I can't believe it. Oh, I ain't got there yet. <laughs> <laughs> we do have a time-honored tradition at the College of Congress of <coughs> pre-prepared rebuttals. Now, my pre-prepared rebuttal is on the internet. It's a synopsis of a book I wrote about 30 years ago, but I don't think it applies too much tonight. Uh, what I found especially interesting, I asked this question about five or 10,000 kilowatts. Now, a kilowatt is 1,000 watts, which is about 7,500 to about 15,000 horsepower in a mobile application. And I was thinking of, of this for steam locomotives. And I've got a long, uh, I could give a pretty long presentation about why the railroads are gonna have to go back to steam locomotives for fast, heavy freight trains. And I think there's been a big mistake in the railroads dieselizing right after in the decade after World War II. There's an article in the uh, September 2004 Trains Magazine about railroads using, misusing 40 mile an hour steam engines on 20 mile an hour trains. They were easy meat for the diesel. A diesel can, uh, it takes a lot fewer diesels to replace one of these high speed steam engines on a 20 mile an hour train than it does on a 40 mile an hour train. Now the railroads did have, there was at least one railroad that was building a very efficient 20 mile an hour steam engine. Why didn't the railroads apply this type of locomotive to their freight trains? The guy comes around and says they didn't consider it fashionable. I think maybe that explains some of the problems of why this technology hasn't gone on any better than it is. Uh, there's a, a book about locomotives it says a number of underdeveloped countries had a bandwagon for the diesel, even though they did not have the higher the, the capital resources, the oil, or the skilled labor that diesel locomotives need. And uh, uh, well, uh, there's a See, that there's just this kind of undercurrent of fashion in supposedly utilitarian, yeah, yeah, the, the Air Force had a test of a fighter plane about 30 years ago called the F-20, which could perform about as well as the other Air Force Mach 2 airplanes, but it cost a hell of a lot less. They couldn't sell it to 
developing nations. Why? Because the U.S. Air Force was not buying it. And it was just considered unfashionable. And I think that's kind of the problem that I think is we're maybe overcoming, I hope so, to a certain extent. Uh, there hasn't any been any real systematic treatment of fashion in these supposedly utilitarian uh, parameters. Other than John Kenneth Galbraith, the new industrial state, it comes right out and says in the original edition, 1967 edition, that the large company cannot be, the small company cannot be restored by bringing the power of the large ones. No, they take rejection of the technology they were taught since early as childhood to worship. If you didn't have this technology, he says, if you didn't, if you want to uh, say the require rejection of this technology and we wouldn't have too many cars, wouldn't have uh, supersonic transport, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't be too much uh, space exploration. But anyway, I do think this ought to be checked out. Uh, I think of a couple other technologies that ought to be checked out. One is steam locomotives, which are very much more efficient, over 40 miles an hour than diesels. They're very good on fast, heavy trains. They were right after World War II, and presumably could be now. And the other is this uh, monorail that I've been, I've been looking for some type of a test application for this, which does need electricity. <coughs> But I, I think it can be. I think it has it all over this uh, uh, bus rapid transit that they're trying to put across now. And I think they're doing that because they're just running out of federal money for all these boondoggles. All right, let's thank our speaker once again, Phil Iasmus, Curtis. That is one of the most nonsensical things I've ever heard about technology of steam engines and the diesels. I'm serious. That's absolutely, Bill, that's crazy. <laughs> that's just so bizarre. It's like you know more about railroads than that nonsense. And you just, what are you? I've got that. That's crazy. <laughs> that is just crazy. <laughs> steam engines require this. Every time you ran a steam engine, after you were done, you had to pull it into a shop. Ten guys had to work on it. The first diesel engine ran for a solid year. Nothing was done to it. <laughs> this is, a, hey, you know how inefficient steam engine, you're talking some technology, it's like 10, 15 percent, it's just, it just goes up all this wasted energy, it's the most wasteful device, I'm sorry, they're very, very nice romantic devices, but terribly inefficient, it has nothing to do with miles per hour. All right, I'm going to be eclectic as usual here, I actually, in Congress one time, uh, it was one of the senators here, uh, as a matter of fact, it was Kirk and all sorts of people show up in the U.S. Congress looking for money for energy type of devices that are going to save the United States. They all have very good meaning. I, I actually was there, I've seen them, they come to, and even the one senator said that the Congress of the United States is not a place where we just sit around with venture capital. All sorts of... The, people come up with things that are going to say the solution to the energy problem and things like this. We've heard them here at the college here. Uh, whether or not you're in the same league of some of these certainly uh, are perhaps not realistic. Other ones certainly are more advanced. Um, even the one fellow we had here, classic here, if their device is not accepted, uh, it's conservative, it's because the guy actually became an arch-conservative libertarian because nobody in government would give him money for his device. 
And so he attributed it to the narrow-sightedness of the elected officials of the United States that they didn't give money for, to his device. Your machine is hardly off the shelf. It seems like you haven't got to be able to develop one for at least for another eight years. Uh, you speak rather confidently, but I think there's a lot of unanswered questions regarding what exactly this reactor is. Now, tragically, this is not a new technology. As a matter of fact, it would be difficult for me to find a technology that has produced greater harm to mankind. I'm not going to embrace it uh, without intense skepticism. This nuclear activities produce the worst form of pollution imaginable. It is odorless, colorless, and instantan instantly deadly in microscopic amounts, as Frank has told us on many occasions. You do not approach this cavalier. Uh, yes, the traditional ones, such as wind, even solar, I'm sorry, are infinitely less risk attendant to this. And I'm not going to do this. I just can't sanction this. I'm sorry. And I'm maybe being facetious. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. But the stuff that's coming out of this reactor is they're reaching temperatures of 800 degrees. And we're not talking about no ice cream here. This is stuff that's way at the extreme of the radioactive elements and things like this. This is cutting edge technology. Now we went down this path once before. Nuclear brought nothing to weaponry and destruction on scale. People have to abandon countries. I mean, this this is just something you have to. It it demands that you simply stop a moment and say, what in the world am I doing? Or should I? Do I need that energy that much? Do I really need it to threaten the lives of people of millions of people? What is it you need that merits you to do that? Okay, Liz, is that of my time? The last thing I gotta say is, if this, the, the wildest thing, I gotta really rip any appell. If this device is wonderful for the military to have military bases all over the place, I mean, what are we, what is that for? So that we can have more military excursions and escapades and stuff like this? We have to, this is an energy plan? This is militarism? <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bill. You can take you can take till eleven o'clock if you want. You know the bug you know, the there. Yeah. 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 All right. Is it just fifteen? Yeah. Yeah, I'll try and do it on that. Okay, I'll start from the back first. The military, I mean, don't be ridiculous. You made fun of this poor gentleman about the trains. You're that's insulting as hell. And you're also a fool if you don't think the military isn't going to utilize an energy source available to civilians. So Are you crazy? Energy. So let me tell you, it's my turn to talk. So, uh, I am the only one. Let me, uh, yeah, one fool at a time. Yeah. So let me tell you, we live in a radioactive world, okay? You know, I like to tell a story about the mother who loves her baby so much, and she wants to make a wonderful a wonderful treat for her child. So she goes into the basement of her old house where the granite foundation is just exuding radon and she starts up her natural gas stove which is exuding radon. And she's going to make a lovely banana soup. A banana pudding, I mean, well the banana pudding is radioactive because the potassium is radioactive in bananas. And she burns it so her radioactive smoke detector goes off. And she's doing this all because she loves her baby so much in her radioactive little house. Well, the fact is, if you think about it, you know, as, as radiation decays, right, 
You know, mercury stays poisonous forever and ever. So when you burn coal, you're releasing mercury into the atmosphere. That mercury is going to be poisonous for a billion years, 10 billion years, till the end of time. You know, you could argue that every day, radioactive material that you create generating power gets less radioactive than it was the day before. It's transmuting into something safer. You know, the, the fact is, I've said it several times, we pay a very high price. And this technology isn't available right this second. We have to start creating it. This technology might be available in three to five years for the Chinese, maybe in about eight or ten years from the, for the Canadians, probably longer than that for the United States. So for at least a decade or more, and that's just the first one, it's going to take a long, long time to roll out enough of these things to have some sort of impact to stop using fossil fuels of one sort of another to create energy. So fine, you know, let's, let's be smart. What the gentleman over here said was probably the smartest thing of all. We should probably use less energy. We're disgusting pigs in this country, the way we utilize energy. And, you know, the Europeans aren't particularly much better. And the Japanese aren't much better than that. And the whole rest of the world, you know, wants to come up to where we are. So, you know, you're absolutely right. 47% might be pushing it, but, you know, certainly 25%, we could get most Americans on board with something like that, where they wouldn't even realize that they're using less electricity. You know, you got to just put yourself in the position of, you know, there's a lot of folks that live almost, uh, you know, lives of just the hell bent to use energy, you know. So, you know, when there's good guys like us that want to live simple, modest lives, and, you know, it only takes a couple of them to counteract a lot of us. So what you got to do is just make things like fluorescent lights that just passively save tremendous amounts of electricity. That is, that's the best near-term solution you could possibly do. And I appreciate the Rocky Mountain Institute for, for promoting stuff like that. But what I don't appreciate is that when I spoke to uh, when I spoke to the Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, the guy said his big his big argument was, you know, this is this is real stuff. You know, the, the molten salt reactor run on thorium is really a you know is really a great solution, but I can't support it. Because if you create large amounts of cheap, abundant energy, people will just use it. <laughs> and they'll waste it. And I said, you know, you're right. I can't argue about that, but that's not a reason not to do it. We need to replace the way we make energy now. I mean, that's all there is to it. We make a huge amount of our electricity in bad and unsustainable ways. And I said, we got 10,000 years. Well, that's just a blink of time, really. You know? but, but we have 10,000 years of thorium energy available to us in the world. And I'm not lying to you about any of the things I said about it. And as uh, the gentleman said, you know, we only have so many options before us in terms of abundant relatively cheap, pretty darn safe compared to every other energy source out there. And, you know, the fact is that you're only going to have a handful of realistic solutions for providing energy for the life we live. 25 or 40 percent more efficient doesn't matter. Even at that rate, we still use vast amounts of energy. And with billions of people wanting to live like us, and billions more people getting born, you know, we need something that will stop impacting the earth so incredibly harshly as what we're doing today. So you got to ask yourself, you know, last year, 22 people died in Europe. I don't know if anyone died in the United States, but 22 people died in Europe maintaining windmills, changing out oil, fixing transmissions. Uh, that's a very, you know, you got to do that a lot. Windmills require a lot of maintenance. 342 people died last year 
in natural gas explosions. Go look at the San, uh, San Bernardino explosion, the San Francisco explosion. 26 people died, 300 homes burned to the ground. All right? Two to 4,000 people a year die from coal. Coal is nobody's friend. The fact is, we choose to use it every day. Every time we turn on a light, we're making a vote to run coal. You know, there is no safe energy source. But the fact is, in the United States of America, nobody in 50 years of commercial power generation has died in a nuclear power plant day. Bullshit. No. Oh, bullshit. Nobody? Okay, who's died? Yeah, the guys that go in and fix the goddamn thing. Let's murder Nobody. what they've done. Karen no, so IBEW should be okay. indicted for well, that. Then let me, yeah, Karen yeah. Silkwood. Let me, That's that bullshit, man. Yeah. All right, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. Let's say every year 100 people die. You go in there and fix it. How many people die every year from natural gas? How many people die in coal mine accidents? You don't think people How many get people cancer? die from windmill maintenance? The overall point is your energy source of choice, solar, wind, hydroelectric, geothermal, fracking natural gas, whatever, it's all dangerous. It's all poisonous. It's all going to kill somebody somewhere. So you need to make a conscious choice. Am I going to pick the most safe, most energy dense energy source available to mankind? Or are you going to pick something else? And you are then going to make a conscious decision to imperil more nature, kill more animals, destroy more lives, so that you can have lights and electric cars and cell phone chargers. So uh, with that, I just want to tell you that I, I, you can check out, and if you go to thoriumenergyalliance.com, if you uh, email me at thoriumenergyalliance at gmail.com, uh, our phone numbers and direct emails and everything are available on the website. If I can't answer something, I'll put you in touch with, with as many experts as uh, I possibly can. And uh, I, I assure you that if you look into this with an open mind, you'll realize this is the safest, cleanest, most abundant energy source that has been given to us on the planet Earth. And that is why I spent so much time and personal energy supporting it. So thank you so much for your time. Well, it's probably it's 11 o'clock and I kind of have to...